The board previously met in executive session um, to consider litigation strategy with respect to Eversource Energy, to consider purchase, sale, lease, of value of real property in relation to open space preservation center, Trail Town Hall, Main Street Quarter project. Executive session pursuant to MGL 30A, Section 21, purpose to conduct collective bargaining sessions with the police union related to numerous grievances filed by the union on behalf of its membership and pursuant to purpose three to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining police union um, and to consider strategy with respect to contract negotiations with non-union employees, town manager, because the chair has declared that discussion in open session will be detrimental to the litigating or negotiating position of the board. And now we will enter into open public session and begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we will begin with our public session. Members of the public are invited to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding town government. Is there anyone who would like to speak to the board tonight? Mr. Palmer. Oh, he beat you, Ed. You're next in line. <laughs> Mr. Palmer, Hi. welcome. John what do you got? Um, 87 Main Street, member of the Hopkinton Cemetery Commission. And the purpose of my attendance is to do a quick demonstration of the, uh, on our website, of the Hopkinton Cemetery records, uh, which have been digitized and are online. And, um, I'm not how, how sure how, uh, I'm not sure how well known this is. I've been using it. Um, it's a terrific tool, and I just like to do show the selectmen how it works, show the public how it works, um, and just to take a couple of minutes. So what I have in front of me is <coughs> I've got the town of Hopkinton homepage. It's up, up on the TV, and what we first do is we have to. Uh, Go to e-government. It's up at the top of the website, and you scroll scroll down to online cemetery records. It's the bottom item, and you click on that, and it brings up it brings up a um, I'm not used to this uh, touchpad brings up a there it is it brings up a uh, another dialog uh, login this blue, the blue script if you enter that then our search matrix will open up so on this ma uh, matrix on the left side there is cemetery, section, lot, plot, last name, first name, middle name, year of death, etc. Those are different ways you can search. Um, if you're trying to find somebody's burial record uh, and you know their name, their last name, you'd put, you'd put that in um, under name. So I'm going to use my own because I know I'm in there, believe it or not. Hope you don't find yourself <laughs> in there. <laughs> cool. I found it yesterday when I was fooling around with this. Oops, I don't want it up there. I gotta get that. So if someone who's doing genealogy or family history, instead of having to try to call the cemetery department to find out where their great great grandfather is, you can do it from it from Oklahoma. Two o'clock in the morning, and get all our town records. So we go down to name, last name. I click there. Then I'm gonna put my last name in P A L M E R. And then I go over to on the right this yellow search button. If I click that, all the last name Palmers are gonna show up uh -huh. in our cemetery records. 
So you'll see there's one in Mount Auburn, there's another one in uh, Evergreen, which has got a first name of Ripley. And then there's another one in Evergreen, which is the first name of Merrill, that's my wife. And there are several others. So uh, what we do here is, um, I want to click on this ver the first one. See, on the left, these red PDF symbols. So if you click on a PDF symbol, it will <coughs> open up the record that's associated with that. And this is a record, and this is a little tricky because this record that's associated with it it's got, it says 12 pages, one of 12. And I know I'm in there because everything that's, everything that's referenced in the names is someplace in a record. So I have to page through I'm on page two. There's a Jess Palmer in there. That's not the one. I hope not. I'm on page three. There's another Jess Palmer. It's probably the same one. I'm on page. I'm back. I'm on four. Oh, I see what's going on here. I'm in the wrong place. I want this one here. There I am. I'm on the fourth, the third one up from the bottom. John and Marilyn. You can um, enlarge this by clicking on this plus, yeah. plus thing so you can see it. So all that says is there's a four grave lot. It says Ripley. That's my mother-in-law or my father-in-law. And uh, that's all that record shows. But if we go back over here to the uh, other records, I want to close this out by going up to that X. That one's closed out. And I want to go down to uh, another. Johnny, in the interest of time, can you just kind of summarize for us what can be found on this and on how people get there? So what, what we have is we have the names of everybody that's rec uh, all the records that the town has have been digitized and are available here. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're mostly a burial records. Some of them are just listings of uh, what mm -hmm. you just saw here, listings of names. Uh, but they're all there. And then you, you search by clicking on the PDF, and then it opens up that other dialog. You click on that, and you'll find whatever the record is. It might not be what you're looking for, but it's what the record is. But some of them will open up, and it'll be the actual burial record, which will show a sketch of the of the of this burial site, and it has, you know, if it's a four lot, it'll say who's in each lot. It's a regular uh, record. It's un invaluable. Excellent. And um, I'm hoping that people use this. Excellent. It's not that hard to use. So the, 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 you start at the home page, you click on e-government. At the bottom, it says cemetery records. You click on that. That takes you to another page with the blue, um, my, the blue line. You click on that, and that brings you to this search, uh, search uh, matrix. John, what is the oldest record we have on file in town? Oh, they go back in the 18, early 1800s. Early 1800s? Yeah. We have records from the church cemetery, um, the old Congregational Church Cemetery. Those go way back, uh, early 1800s. Those may, I'm not sure if they got on, into our records because the, the church had them and the town took them over or how that worked. But these are town records. Hmm. And does it show uh, available openings? No. no it doesn't. No, no, that's just what's in there. But this okay. was a CPA project that started out first just to get them in a safe form because they were just in paper <coughs> records and notebooks. And then we took it a step further so that this is probably one of the first communities to have this level of public records access where you can not only look at everything, you can do a search by maiden name, by date of death. So genealogists, family historians, 
Um, it's got the maps, and it's just a wonderful, a wonderful tool um, that was paid for by CPA funds. And anybody that's interested in their family history, um, there's tons of stuff to I find there. I use it all the time in Absolutely. searches. I used it yesterday for a search that came up at the Historical Society. Um, I like it a lot. Well, it's, it's a really nice example of what we can do with our community thank preservation fund, so thank you. Thanks, Mr. Palmer. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. Harrell? I, I bet you all think I'm here to talk about bike lanes. <laughs> Not exactly. Firstly, Norman, thank you for your letter. That's the first letter I've had in response to one of the letters I have written about bike lanes in Hopkinton. You're welcome. It was a bit of a surprise. It must have taken you a lot of time. It's a you had to do some time. work and some research. Mm -hmm. It was very clear. It was very understandable. I don't agree with some of it. Mm -hmm. It's based on work that was done by people with degrees in traffic management and that sort of thing, which I don't have. I got almost seven decades of bike time. I've commuted into Boston in the summertime. I commuted within Boston and Cambridge. I had 10 years in the bike industry. I did bike safety demonstrations, where to be, what's expected to be predictable, and to consider yourself invisible. And you may all know of an experiment that was done. We had a basketball game, and the subjects were to watch and count the number of times the ball was passed from player to player. And while this was going on, a person dressed in a gorilla suit walked across the court. People didn't see it. <laughs> because when we're little kids and we're first learning to cross the street, what are we told? Look both ways for? Gorillas. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, play along with me here. Cars. 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 So now when we're driving down the road in our car, we don't see bicycles. When you're on a bicycle, you're invisible. To kind of continue the family history, my parents met biking in Gettysburg Battlefield. My great, great aunt and uncle, I have a picture of him, a tintype, on their tandem tricycle. So I think about this and I've written three letters about bike lanes in Hopkinton. I've got all this experience and no one ever said, Hey, Ed, what do you think about this? In fact, when I've written, I've got no response. So my other co-conspirator in this, and you may have seen the name John Allen. I've known him since 1972. He's an MIT nerd. He's got the nerdiness to match up with anyone from Mass DLT. He's offered to come out and discuss some of the issues with these bike lanes. Offer was never taken up. John is also an expert witness. As far as bike lanes, I have a pretty jaundiced view of bike lanes because I had a very bad experience early on. But I have to confess, like the bike lane in Milford is fabulous. It's what the bike lane in Hopkinton should be, not what it is. So I'm sitting here feeling like Henry Fonda. You might have seen the film 12 Angry Men. I feel like Henry Fonda's character in 12 Angry Men trying to convince people of, that my views have some validity. So in, the, in 2011, I wrote a letter. So this was after the first meeting that we had. And a piece of paper was passed around. They wanted our name, phone number, address, email. I said, oh, they're going to be talking to us and call us in and see what we think. So I'm going to quote from that letter. I attended a public presentation done at the high school. When an attendance sheet was passed around, I provided my name, address, phone number, and email. I expected, quite naturally, to be advised of future meetings. I was not. I have not been advised of one meeting that's taken <coughs> place other than the mass DOT meeting that was at the senior center. Now, some pushback I've gotten. I, I commented that people would typically be riding through it 15 to 25 miles an hour, and some exception was taken to that. What's the speed limit in downtown Hopkinton? 25 or 30. 35, I think. 25. Yeah. It's 25. Yeah. So if someone is riding their bicycle through downtown Hopkins at 25 miles an hour keeping up with traffic, does that present a problem? Not to my way of thinking. And then I'm going to close with this. Sometime after this is all done, there's going to be an accident involving a bicycle between Ash Street and at least Wood Street. 
And when that happens, the personal injury lawyer is going to turn to his expert witness Rolodex. He's going to turn it to B for bicycle, and the first name he's going to see is John Allen. John Allen has all everything that we have corresponded about in his files. He knows it. The second name he's going to come across is Carl Barton. And I've known Carl Barton for almost as long. So, and I have, I have two handouts. And I have been to the same address in Hopkinton for 38 years. You haven't thrown me out yet, although I was thinking of that. And then last but not least, you may all know of Mr. Wells, H.G. Wells. Every time I see an adult on a bicycle, I no longer despair for the human race. <laughs> Keep that to yourself, don't show it. And you can show that to anybody you want. Oh, yeah, the gender. Of course I don't. <coughs> there's a story behind that, which First I will gladly tell you, but this is following up. Can I share it? Absolutely. <laughs> Mr. Crowley, would you like to speak Have a good to day. us? Thank you, Ed. Ed. Thank Ed. you. I promise I will be shot. You're an illegal immigrant. Excuse me? You're an illegal immigrant. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, uh, my name is Dennis Crowley. I am the co owner of the Muffin House Cafe. Uh, two reasons I wanted to. Thank you to, for that. We love it. Oh. Thank, uh, thank, actually, thank, I came to thank the, the board and I thank the, uh, the town. Um, we have um, four establishments and, and the town was very helpful. Um, the town department heads, their staff, um, they weren't easy, um, but they were very helpful in our permitting process and uh, they, hope, they helped us open up on time. So I, I thank the staff and, and in particular, the welcoming from the community, Hopkinton community has been very kind to us, so we appreciate that very much. Mm. So with that, I commend the board for um, meeting tonight on the seventh game of the Bruins, which uh, had just oh, about man. ready to start, so I'll make it quick. <coughs> uh, the main purpose that I'm here tonight is that <clears throat> either I read or I heard something about the possibility of some additional parking in the town. Um, we are concerned, Sheldon and I, my partner is there is limited parking as there is now mm -hmm. um, there is difficult to find additional parking for us and I don't know whether the rumor is true and I'm not asking for an answer tonight I am just here to support the possibility if there's any way particularly with the construction that will be coming in town mm -hmm. if there was any way at all that um, the town would consider some form of additional parking to take some relief off uh, when the construction starts so with that, um, I'll leave you as I hurry home to watch the seventh game of the Bruins. Thank you. And, and it's, it's not a rumor, it is true. We are working on that because we recognize that's real integral, really integral to the success of downtown. So you're right. Good, I appreciate it. And it's not often we have the Medway group come to speak with us, but you're sort of an associate citizen of Hopkinton now. You're part of our business community. And we enjoy seeing you and John at our regional meeting. So Good, the regional meetings. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you folks, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Carley. Anyone else? Mr. Foisey. Boy, a lot of takers tonight. Your weeks with nobody. Good evening. Ron Foisey, 25 Chamberlain Street. I'm here speaking on behalf of the Economic Development Council of the Chamber. And I, I wanted to start out with the picture of the master plan here showing it all starts here in less than 360 days on April 20th next year will be the next Boston Marathon and the current 75% plan of the DOT is stating that they they're likely to put shovels in the ground after the marathon next year and if uh, if I reference the economic development goals of the 2017 master plan um, the second bullet point says provide more downtown parking when construction starts next year whatever businesses we have left in downtown are likely to be decimated unless we do something dramatic to improve parking and try to keep the downtown businesses alive 
So uh, the Economic Development Council met uh, earlier last week and parking is our mission number one to sustain and increase development of businesses in the downtown section with the downtown quarter product project coming this is more urgent than ever before so uh, looking at your executive session and seeing that you're discussing a lot of those things we're hopeful that additional parking is high up on the agenda thank you for your time thanks Ron. thank you all set okay well thank you everyone and uh, we'll move along now uh, first to our consent agenda uh, there are several items the board minutes board will consider approving the April 9th 29, uh, 2019 Selectman's minutes item two library fund gift the board of selectmen will consider accepting a $100 gift to the Hopkinton library gift fund from Stephen and Mary Ansel of 25 Alprilla Farm Road in Hopkinton item three parade permit special temporary alcohol license for the seventh annual Evan and Girardi Memorial 5k run and walk the board of selectmen will consider approving a parade permit and special temporary alcohol license for Live for Evan Inc. for the se seventh annual Evan Girardi Memorial 5K Run Walk to be held on Saturday, October 5, 2019, from 9 to 10 a.m., starting at the Hopkinton High School Loop Road and ending at EMC Park. Expected number of participants, including runners and staff and volunteers, 5 to 600. Applicant is requesting a fee waiver for the special temporary alcohol license and has received approval from Parks and Rec to hold the event at EMC Park. Certificate of Insurance is pending. Entertainment application request has been withdrawn as music only will be played through the speakers. No amplification used. Pepper's Catering will be the caterer for the event. Tip certified service will be serving alcohol 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And item four. So if this is if that item is approved with the parade permit, we will be we um, voting to waive the fee as well unless that's separated out. And item four is a parade permit 16th annual Sharon Timlin Road Race 5K Road Race event, a race to cure ALS. Board of Selectmen will consider approving a parade permit for Stephanie Whalen on behalf of the Sharon Timlin event, a race to cure ALS for 5K road case. Race to be held Saturday, June 15, 2019 at 8.30 a.m. Road closures requested for this event are for approximately 30 minutes. Hayden Road from intersection to Grove Street to intersection with Chestnut. Road race will begin at Hopkins School Road and end at the Loop Road. By lot H, expected number of participants is 1,800. So would anyone like to pull any of those items out for separate discussion? Hearing none, I will request a motion to approve the consent agenda. The items on the, congen on the consent agenda, including a waiver of the fee for the Live for Evan event. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. Madam Chair, if I may, could we also um, uh, do the same for the permit for um, the uh, Timlin Road Race? If they, if there's any, uh, if there's any fees involved, I believe there isn't in that one. It was not requested. Oh yeah, there isn't. Okay, there's no alcohol. It was okay. not requested. Okay. Okay. Um, Scheduled for 645 was Roselli and Clark Associates audit report. We have a, a, a 730 public hearing, but we can open that and then ask to return to it. So if the rep, um, our next agenda item, let's at least open this Roselli and Clark Associates audit report. Terenzio Vopicelli of Roselli Clark and Associates will give a brief review of the town's 2018 financial statements, the completion of three significant capital projects, library DPW, Marathon Elementary School, the impact of the adoption of new OPEB standards, and a general review of the town's financial condition. Mr. Volpicelli, welcome. Good evening, Chairperson Wright, honorable members of the board, town manager Kamalo, assistant town manager Lazarus. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Terenzio Volpicelli. 
I am your the town's independent auditor. I was engaged to perform a financial statement audit for the year end of June 30th of 2018. That was the second year of a three-year contract with the town, and that contract was dated June 28th of 2017. In light of the time constraint, I have uh, what we refer to as our required disclosures. I'm going to very briefly go over it, and then this formal letter will be turned over to the town manager for your records and archives. <clears throat> you can take your time, by the way. When we get to the public hearing, we can open it and then ask them to wait. So don't, don't, you're okay. not rushed. Okay. Madam Chair, quick question, if I could, please, Mr. To, the, to, to Mr. Uh, Volpincelli. Volpincelli, yes. Volpincelli. Have any of what you're about to present been presented to anyone yet in town hall? In other words, have you provided this report to anyone yet before today? The, the financial statements? Yes. yes. That's all, that's oh, all so been provided. It's all been reviewed. All been oh, reviewed. sure. Okay. Yes. And this letter you're about to read, has that been provided to anybody in advance? Uh, no. This is the, the first. It's just, <laughs> it's just a standard disclosure. It's in our packet, though, so it's, it's been released to the public. Okay, good. Thanks. Because we received it in our packet, so okay. it's out in public. Okay. Um, professional standards require that we communicate the following related to our audit. Management, which is includes the folks uh, within the Board of Selectmen, is responsible for the selection and use of appropriate accounting policies. The significant accounting policies used by the town are described in note two of the financial statements. As we described in the notes, the town changed its accounting policies relative to its accounting for other post-employment benefits, or OPEB, in 2018. That was the result of the adoption of uh, Government Accounting Standards number 75. And this is something we discussed uh, this time last year when we, were, when we first met with you. And as a result of the adoption, a prior period restatement was recorded, which again was discussed about a year ago with you folks. We noted no transactions entered into the town during the year for which there was a lack of authoritative guidance or consensus. All significant transactions appear to have been recognized in the financial statements in the proper period. Accounting estimates are an integral part of the financial statements prepared by management and are based on management's knowledge and experience about past and current events and assumptions of future events. The most sensitive estimates affecting the town's financial statements related to its pension liability, which is actuarially determined at the county retirement level. We evaluate the key factors and assumptions used to develop the pension liability and we've determined them to be reasonable in relation to the financial statements as taken as a whole. The OPEP liability, which is also actuarially determined, we evaluate the key factors and assumptions used in developing that uh, liability, as well as management's estimate for the allowance for doubtful accounts. Those same, those same three items are also more sensitive disclosures, which are also disclosed in notes two, three, and four of the financial statements. We're pleased to report that we encountered no significant difficulties in dealing with management and performing and completing our audit. Uh, for the purposes of this discussion, a disagreement with, with, uh, with management is a financial accounting, reporting, and auditing matter, whether or not resolved to our satisfaction. That could be significant to the financial statements or to our report. We're pleased to report there were no such disagreements that arose during the course of our audit. We request a certain representation from management that were included in the manager representation letter, which was dated on December 3rd of 2018, and that happens to be the, the final date of the financial statements. Um, and again, the rest of it is, isn't very um, significant. This, this formal letter will be submitted to the town manager. So as has been provided to you, you have a, a set of financial statements. They're roughly 60 pages long. Um, our audit opinion is dated December 3rd of 2018. Um, the major stories that took place in 2018, the fiscal year 2018, um, surrounded the completion of the library, the DPW, and the elementary school. Um, those are three major capital projects. They all concluded right around the end of the year or at some point during 2018. Um, in connection with that, you ended up selling roughly $25 million of general obligation bonds to finance uh, those capital projects, and you received about a $1.7 million premium associated with that transaction. The other big story for the year was the adoption of the OPEP standard, and this is something that has been uh, discussed for many years uh, within this industry. It tends to be uh, the most commonly discussed topic uh, during my post-audit conferences. Um, 
the adoption of this OPEP standard resulted in a, um, a restatement to the prior period of roughly, <coughs> I'm having a hard time reading, $11 million or $10 million, where it's hard to read. Um, there were several deficits in capital projects. At the end of the year, every one of them was covered by a ban, which is what's required by the, uh, the Commonwealth. And um, the finance department and accounting department went through a, a number of personnel changes. We're pleased to see that uh, the town was very proactive and really forward thinking in, in the way that it selected how it was going to replenish that talent. Um, it's not typical to see a quote unquote CFO in a uh, town uh, structure. Um, uh, somebody who's going to be providing uh, an awful lot of FPNA and um, strategic uh, direction. So that, that's uh, quite refreshing to see. Um, financially, the town still maintains its AAA rating from S&P that was last affirmed uh, in November of 2017. Uh, the unassigned fund balance in the general fund is $8.8 .8 million. Um, when you take the assigned and unassigned uh, fund balances and you compare that to the 2018 general fund expenditures, that results in what's referred to as a reserve ratio of about 11%, and that puts you in what S&P would call a strong position. Um, included in that amount was roughly $3.4 million of stabilization funds, which are, for gap accounting purposes, included in the general fund. For the results of operations, property taxes continue to make roughly 60% of your revenues year to year, and uh, education expenses are approximately three quarters of all of your expenditures. Um, 71% in uh, 2018, 74% in 2017. We're pleased to note that the town established an OPEP trust fund uh, at the end of 2018. Um, it has roughly $2 million put aside. Previously, that was in a stabilization fund. Uh, your actuary estimates that that puts that fund at roughly 3% funding at <coughs> June 30th of 2018. To put that in perspective, that puts the community and roughly the top 10 percentile of the state as far as funding ratios. Um, that percentage is not terribly scientific because at this point in time, there is not a central repository for all of the communities in the state. That um, threshold is based off of a single actuary who represents roughly uh, well, the largest actuary in the state, and based on <laughs> their population of, of uh, communities, which is assumed to be a representative sample of the rest of the state, you would say that the community is in the top 10 percentile. Uh, many communities haven't put any monies aside. Um, that, in a nutshell, is the um, financial condition of the town. Uh, one thing I failed to mention is, again, the largest obligations to the town is the town's long-term debt it's net OPEP liability, it's net pension liabilities. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns about the financial statements themselves? I, I had one question um, about what you said about the stabilization at 3%, putting us on, up in the top 10%, because I, I understood that the recommendations, I thought it was from DOR, was that communities have 5%, but we were low. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, is right now, as it currently is constituted, the funds that you've put aside versus what your actuary has estimated your actuarial liability to be, you're roughly 3% funded. On the OPEB, not On the OPEB. Oh, no, no. I thought you were talking about stabilization when you said 3%. No, 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 no. That was the OPEB fund. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Okay, okay. Because I thought you said stabilization. I may I have. Thought, I apologize I, I, if I, I thought did. Our, 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 so our stabilization goal, I think, still is 5%, isn't it? Um, we're not at that. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, it's still 5%. Yes, yes. And again, you have about $3.4 million yeah, in there for that. Our accountants were nodding back there. Yeah. So we've go, we got a ways to go on that, at least. <laughs> well, our budgets keep going up so much that the 5% keeps getting harder to get to. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Thank you. Madam Chair, so you mentioned the edu education expenses were approximately 70-some percent. Can you just expand on that a little bit further? Well, that would be all of the costs of the... Um, personnel, all the pupil costs. That is a fully burdened expense 
figure that I gave you. So that's also going to include an allocations of uh, insurances, your net OPEP liability, and so pensions liability. So a lot of other stuff besides our general operating budget. That is really based on a full accrual accounting, which would be very similar to, say, a company like an EMC, how they would report. Yeah, okay. yeah. Because we typically run about 55 to 57 percent education. Sure. 40 whatever on it you know, general and, government and in the, our operating budget annually. And then that number, you wouldn't include your health insurance or, or whatnot. Right. That would right. be a separate line item. Okay. Yes. I was wondering that too, that's why. Right, because when we put, when we put all the uh, benefits and everything, you know, it, it, the um, town side of it gets a heck of a lot smaller. Yeah, because I think out of an 80 million budget, I think it's like 60, mm -hmm. 38 something. And so yeah, once again, that's a fully, that's a fully burdened number. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. In addition, we issued a uh, management letter, also dated December 3rd of 2018. We noted no uh, material weaknesses or significant deficiencies. We also noted that from our initial management letter that we issued uh, January 26th of 2018, the town made a number of improvements, which is actually somewhat remarkable in light of the, the, the transition and turnover within your accounting and finance departments. Um, there are still a, a number of areas that would require um, some attention to, and uh, again, that's, that's to be expected, particularly with the transition and turnover. But for the most part, um, we conducted our, our financial statement in a very um, timely and efficient manner. In fact, I think we lost two days because of the fire alarm and whatnot in here. We were still able to, to complete it, our, our audit on time. Uh, on schedule, and that's uh, essentially a testament to the quality of the records that were provided to us. So thank you. Really quick question. How would you say the education expenses all burned up like that? How do they compare against other communities around the state? Is there a, national, a state average that? I'm unaware of a state average, but if I had to compare, it, they're all over 50%. I have I haven't seen a, I haven't seen a community that's under fifty percent. Um, they tend to be right around two thirds to three quarters. So you're you're kind of right in that ballpark on, on a full on a fully burden. And again, it even includes depreciation expense of the buildings and that that figure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how how often are these audits done? Because I don't recall you coming before us before well this are, I, I came last year at the uh, uh, the cable the, the table company the HKM TV station oh, okay. yes right. yes I wasn't, I wasn't recalling previously that. we were not engaged as your <coughs> auditor so I can't speak to but, that but it is, it is this is annual he's got a very common name you probably <laughs> 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 yes yes so we um, you yeah, we perform these financial statements audits annually um, it's a matter of good governance. It's actually required because of the, certainly because of the debt load that you folks have, as well as the federal funds that you receive. That's part of our audit. Also, we do what's called a single audit to comply with the OMB requirements um, uh, surrounding, principally surrounding your educational grants. Mr. Carmelo, are you happy? With that question? No. Um, in fact, uh, in summary. We have had a very productive relationship with uh, Terence Vios firm, uh, focusing on three goals. Number one, uh, bringing an independent eye to really look at our accounting system. Number two, using this process to educate the public, and that's why he's here in front of the board, and we're making most of the information from the audit available online. And then number three, um, the recommendations that come from this process have been very helpful to the community. Uh, and in that regard, we're also looking for transfer of knowledge from his team to our team, and I think that's, that's starting off very well now. I would just add one more to that, because anytime you bring an external auditor in, it's all about material findings, and there were no material findings. That's big, that's news, and we expect that, but it's important, I think, that everybody understands that. Excellent. Excellent, good. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your time thank and for the good report. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Right back on time, too. Yeah. We'll look through that consent agenda, fortunately. Yep. So we're going to just kind of spin our wheels for about 30 seconds here. <coughs> okay. So we say no.
yours. That's why I don't even ask anymore. <laughs> if you see fill it up, but I, I and you always say no for candy too. Gonna wait a couple more seconds till it's 7:30 to 7 open the public hearing. You have 7:30. 1930. Right. Yep. Clock's not right. Okay. The hour being 7:30, according to Mr. Ted Stone. <laughs> we, <laughs> we will open a public hearing for the Entertainment Carnival Sunday license from the Hoppington Parent Teacher Association slash Fiesta Shows. Welcome. The Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing relative to an Entertainment Carnival Sunday license application received from Aaron Graziano on behalf of the Hopkinton Parent Teacher Association for a Fiesta Show Carnival to be held in the Hopkinton High School parking lot. Applicant is requesting the following event hours, Thursday, June 20, from 6 to 10 p.m., Friday, June 21st, from 6 to 10.30 p.m. Saturday, June 22nd, from 1 to 10.30 p.m. And Sunday, June 23rd, from 1 to 9 p.m. Setup would begin on Thursday, June 17, 2019, to allow the state time to license before opening. J.C. Parmenter has granted permission to allow Carnival crews to set up sleeping quarters until school lets out for the summer. The trailers will move to school grounds on the afternoon of the last day of school. Expected number of attendees could be 375 to 475 at any one time. Welcome, Ms. Graziano. Move to open the public hearing. Move to open the public Second. hearing. Is it Second. Seconded? All those in favor say aye. 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 And opposed, unanimous public hearing is open. Welcome. And Thank you. Ms. I brought I Mr. E.J. E. Dean from Fiesta, Fiesta. Shows. Yeah. Welcome, Mr. Dean. So I think we've been down this road before, but yes. tell us your plans. So um, this is our third year, and uh, last year, even despite having rainouts on two of the biggest population days, we did really well. We brought in about $9,000 for our schools, and we are here again to ask permission to use the school grounds in order to hold the carnival. Um, from, from what I heard, and I do do post meetings with um, all of those involved, the schools, the police, um, I didn't hear of any issues last year. Um, things seem to go very smoothly, and we're hoping for a smooth, um, another smooth year. I did list the hours per what the carnival typically runs. Last year we did um, shorten those by a bit, for the neighbors, and we are willing to do that again this year as kind of a show of good faith to help make it a little bit less um, cumbersome on them. I'm sorry, could you say that part again? What you I listed the hours based on what the carnival runs every I year, see. you know, when they go to any, any town. Yeah. Um, but last year we did shorten those hours, and we are willing to shorten those again this year you know, for the neighbors. Yeah, I, I noticed that last year's permit uh, did not ha went, go to 10.30, it went to 10, 10 on those yeah. nights. So that's up for discussion. Um, so questions from the board members? I have no questions. Uh, nope, just, well, the only question I have is, um, are you planning this year to do the same thing that you did last year where you put the more noisy rides you know, more proximal to the building and the quieter rides <coughs> proximal to the home. Correct. All the design changes we made to accommodate the neighbors, uh, we're, we yeah. have all intention to do that again. Okay. Thank you. Did we learn anything from last year? So I remember the first year we made some big changes like that. Yep. Did anything else? Are there any new changes that we did, that we learned last year that we're incorporating that can, uh, again, help any uh, any other neighborhood concerns or concerns that you had as, as the nothing new arose last year we had talked at the meeting prior to it that we were going to put up stanchions along the highway uh, i'm sorry along the road um but when we talked with the police they were just concerned about that causing issues for foot traffic <coughs> even outside of carnival hours so they stationed a police car over there. It, it's very dark. There's not a lot of street lights in that area. So 
um, that was that was the way we solved that issue to kind of keep it safe and also um, to minimize the foot traffic in front of the neighbors. I actually saw that whole thing unfold and in a collaborative effort between you and the police chief and it was taken care of on the spot. So that was uh, that was well done. Thank you. Right, so, so and, and I do. Uh, <coughs> oh, I did have a couple of things. Um, so last year, uh, there was a concern about the noise with, from the neighbors. I was just wondering, did you talk to the neighbors in any of your planning this year? Did you bring them into any of that collaborative? I, I didn't talk with them personally, but I do send out the um, forum a notification and mm -hmm. at, per the license, but I haven't spoken with them personally. I actually did see one of the neighbors at the event, and mm -hmm. I... Um, was able to work with the carnival to just give them free passes. Um, she said that her, her son had been sick and he had been dying to go to the carnival. And so finally on the last day, he was well enough and they had just walked over and I gave them a bunch of passes to enjoy the rides on us. Excellent. Well, it's a fun event. I mean, I know, uh, I know my kids had fun there too. Um, there was other one, other, well, one other concern that I recall from last year was that uh, some of the ride operators smoking on the sidewalks, like yep. going across the street and smoking. Is that something that's uh, that part of our protocol where that's not going to be allowed? Or yep, be that was handled last year, and I had no follow-up to that. I had no issues reported. Okay. So, Yeah, I, I believe that was originally brought up from two years ago uh, when they were going over to right. Pementers. So we made, we made changes um, for last year uh, that I believe didn't have any further uh, concerns. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I, I know this is a, pub, a posted public hearing, and there was a butter notification as well. So, mm -hmm. and, I, and I am going to turn to the, those in attendance to see if they have some input as well, so that if there are community needs, well, I, I want to ask you just, just one thing. So I think um, you must have been referencing this earlier. I was looking at the conditions that were written in last year's and um, Maria in our office just simply put the same conditions on but I think we want to change it because last year item 5 talked about barricades erected on the easterly side of Hayden or across the street from the carnival in order to prevent use of the sidewalk in front of residences that was because of the residences but at the time I remember um, we or the police determined they it really they couldn't block the public way because it's a sidewalk so right. they made it I see the chief is here and we were going to work through how we were it this year because he made some different accommodations to keep the sidewalk open but to have it patrolled or something so that carnival goers could have the access but the issue of other people their staff members hanging out in front of the houses would not be so um chief can i just ask you how did you address that and then we can figure out how to word this in the condition so that it because this is not a correct condition we, we don't want to say barricade shall be erected what sh what shall we as uh, uh she uh, mentioned uh, earlier we worked that out on the fly uh last year we saw an issue with that and um basically because of the uh dim litted area we actually uh, had a cruiser mm -hmm. uh, in that area to with one of the detail offices and we'll keep up uh, a, a person just assigned to that area to keep an eye on it as well as uh, last year so this condition about barricades doesn't apply is there anything any wording you think should address that or we'll just understand with your working with the police that they will yeah we, we would want on. any uh, barricades uh, that yeah. would uh, affect the pedestrian flow and cause a danger to them walking in the road so that'll just be part of your regular coordination with the police to address that that kind of absolutely um critical area mm -hmm. okay all right That's good. no i have something oh, mr ted stone oh. so oh. This, <laughs> this is kind of my thing um <clears throat> how did we do last year with all the quarries uh we had no issues uh we um verified through uh, fo photo IDs uh, through their credentials uh, along with the uh, listed uh, uh, Cori checks that were provided uh, through the company and uh, everyone matched up and there was no issues and we'll continue to do the same thing as this year we've already been provided the list of people that have been quarried so this being a public hearing are there members of the public who would like to weigh in 
Just come up and state your name and address. Hi, my name is Sue McCarthy. I live at 22 Winter Street. I am here because I oppose the carnival. Um, I had something happen to me. I wish I had come last year actually to the hearing. I found out that the carnival, I went to the carnival two years ago. Um, and I, I didn't realize that it was actually coming back. But I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone because I don't generally do this. So I wrote down what I wanted to say. So I'm going to read that. So. I am here tonight to share my experience at the HPTA Carnival two years ago, hoping you will deny the application for the carnival going forward. In 2017, I attended the carnival with my two children who were aged 10 and 12. While I was there, I was hit in the head by a large, approximately six foot by eight foot aluminum sign that was not secured properly. A gust of wind blew the unsecured sign into my head, resulting in, t in a concussion. I went to my primary care, I, it, physici physician documented. I did go to end up at the doctor because of not feeling well after, and I was diagnosed with a concussion. It is out of luck that the sign did not hit either of my children or any of the other children that were around when the sign blew um, into me. After the incident, I shared what happened with the HPTA, the town manager, the school committee, the board of selectmen, and the superintendent. All done via email. There was no representative up from the HPTA or the town at the carnival when I actually was hit with the sign. So there was no one there. So I did this all through email. As upsetting as it was to me that as I was watching my kids ride ride around the carnival that a huge sign hit me in the head, I found the email response I received from all, including the organization that I was a member of, to be lacking in genuine concern and, and really to be just as upsetting to me as the actual situation. At no time did anyone reach out to me with a phone call or even in person to find out how I was doing or exactly what happened. The carnival may be considered an important fundraiser and I, I love the PTA. I have nothing but great things to, to say about the PTA. We, there are wonderful opportunities that our children have in our schools because of the funding that they have or that they, 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 they raise, the fundraising that they do. Um, however, there is a moral responsibility that comes along with attaching the PTA's name or even the town of Hopkinton with any event. To me, this responsibi responsibility includes investigating any incident involving a personal injury. Um, I've never talked to anyone. I've actually never had a conversation with anyone from the PTA, from the town, from the school, committee from the superintendent about what actually happened to me that day I've talked to my family and, and my friends about it no, no one else in town um, and I actually have pictures of the sign that hit me so if anyone's interested although some of you I think I don't know who was on the committee when I said that but anyways um, the only reason my husband and I attended that carnival, we, we actually don't go to carnivals because we don't feel that they're safe, but we did allow our kids and we brought our kids to this carnival because it was a fundraiser for the PTA, which is an organization that we do support. Um, so anyways, I, I was surprised and disappointed last year and honestly, I, I guess I was a little naive I thought that I had passed on what to me was something horrific and, and something that was avoided, someone being seriously injured, to the people that I needed to pass it on to. But apparently I didn't because, you know, the carnival did come to town last year. So I decided at that point that I would just move on and if it came back this year I would come and say something. So here I am. I am skeptical and find it somewhat short-sighted that the PTA or town feels they can guarantee the safety of a traveling carnival. There are so many moving parts. I was hit in the head by a sign that was leaning against a cart that should have been, that should have been secured. Someone just forgot to secure it. 
So it, it looked like all of the other signs of the, at the carnival. You could not tell that it was any different. It, it looked exactly like all the other ones did. Um, as a society, it seems we react when there's a tragedy, ignoring the red flags that are generally there all along. As a town, I believe we can do better. We owe it to ourselves and our children. My hope is you will consider what happened to me as a huge red flag and will deny the HPTA application for the carnival to return to Hopkinton, or honestly, the PTA themselves will do it. The safety of all who attend any event is much more important than the amount of money raised. And I question the town can 100% guarantee the safety of everyone at that carnival. The day I attended that carnival, it was not safe. And that sign could have not been secured. I went on Sunday. It probably wasn't secured Saturday. I, who knows? I, I, I find, I, who knows? But you can speculate a little on that one, I guess, right? There are many other options for fundraisers. My hope is the PTA will explore other options. Thank you for listening to me. Um, it was hard for me to come. It's hard for me to say this and get up in front of this to do. And I truly do love the PTA. I, I really do. Um, I feel better having spoken about my experience to those who are responsible for bringing the carnival to town and ultimately responsible for, sa for the safety of all those who attend, including many families from Hopkinton and a lot of young children. So that's it. So I'm hoping that you'll consider that. So thank you. Through the chair, that's, that's what, that was the reason for my first question was, you know, we, we learned a lot from the, from the 17, and then, we, they, then they, 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 moved, they moved things, changed smokers, did better quarry checks, and that's why I asked, did we learn anything from 18? And, 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 and you know, the, the, the way I try to look at things is, you know, can, can things be, be improved to try and make them, and make them as safe and, 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 and as entertaining as possible? Um, yeah, I, it, no, sorry. No, go ahead. I interrupted. Uh, yeah, it, it, because uh, it, you know, it, it's it, it is a big fundraiser for them, and um, last it, you know, they, it, in seventeen there were a lot of problems, and um, last year was a was a very tough decision. You know, and putting all the, the conditions that that, that the uh, chair was was speaking of to try and make sure that we mitigated as many as possible. And that's why I wanted to see, you know, what what other what other issues came up last year, and I was uh, and I was happy to hear that that there there weren't, and any ones that did come up were mitigated immediately. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that uh, I don't remember the the email coming through. I'm sorry, I was I was on the board in '17. That's right. I have all the emails. I, I have all the correspondence. I have everything with me. I have pictures of the sign. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and it, I, I think it's very important for for the. Uh, uh, the operator to, to know uh, what happened to you and to see the sign again to make sure it works. But that's my thought. I guess for me it's the unknowns. So at that carnival, that particular one, it was that the sign wasn't secured. But how can you guarantee at a carnival where there are so many different things that could possibly happen that everything is safe? So if you feel you can 100% guarantee that, that that is safe, than, than that, sure. But I actually, the reason why I came here selfishly is now it's off of me. <laughs> I told everyone my story, and you guys can do what you want to do. Well, um, I, I mean, I just want to mention, I, I, I remember hearing about this a couple years ago. I, I knew that, you know, the medical part had been handled in one way or another. You were fortunately not more seriously injured, but, you know, concussion is not, is not, is not funny by any means. But um, I, I thoroughly thought or believed that it would have been addressed or, or, you know, you would have been reached out to more than you were and by someone in the town. So for that way, for that way, apologize. Um, I guess I just have to say, and I don't know what Fiesta Show's track record is. I am under the assumption, because we've had them a couple of years, that they have, as Carnival, Groups go have had a a good record of producing a quality event. Um, 
I do think, and, and I don't mean this to sound callous, but it is very difficult with anything in life to, pre to give a 100% guarantee ever that nothing is going to happen to the TV above. You know, it's human error, it's something's not tightened, or I mean, all kinds of things do happen. I guess we would look to the record of the operator. Um, you know, have there been equipment issues in the past? Um, certainly when something is put up and taken down as a, as a traveling carnival is, there's more opportunity. Um, but it is, I think it is very difficult to guarantee, to say we can, we guarantee 100% on, on anything that's, you know, that's kind of the way the world is, but um, anyway, I, I am, I am, I am very sorry if you didn't get an adequate response from the town. I think there so, were other members who wanted to say something. So, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't there, I wasn't tightening the bolts, I was on the board at the time, mm -hmm. but I just want to say we're sorry for that. So, oh, yeah, you I don't, don't have to apologize. I don't have, I don't have any excuses. Yeah. Uh, I've had a concussion or two in my life as well. I know what they're like. And I'm very sorry that that happened at, a, at such a great, you know, the potential to be a great event for our town and, and our community. So that's all I have is I'm sorry for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You don't have to do it. Is that it? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Are there any other public comments? Yes. Good evening. My name is Martin Bays. My address is 106 Hayden Row. I'm the immediate abutter to the Arts Center, so I would be one of the two abutters closest to the sides of the school property. I very much support the, the event, but I would ask that I, I think similarly in the, the previous year, that this, the ending time of the event is a little bit of a problem for me. Uh, obviously, if there's a way to move the hours, to shift them towards the, the center of the day, particularly at the weekend, looking at the hours, I would, I would much prefer it if it did not go beyond 9.30 on Thursday and Friday and not beyond 10 o'clock on Saturday. Uh, the other request, I don't think it's a reasonable one to make, but if anybody can figure out how to have them play a different song on each day. <laughs> I, I would say that after the first day it was okay, after the second day it was marginal, and by Sunday I would not describe my reactions as positive. So if I hear, I hear positive feedback from behind, thank you very much in, in anticipation of that. So that, I, I think that summarizes my comments, basically very much in support of it, but anything we, we could do to shift the, the hours somewhat earlier, because as, 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 with, the, with the present hours, obviously it's ending significantly after sunset. I don't think it would make a significant difference to the funding if, that was, if the hours were shifted slightly. I'm sure people would, would accommodate that, and it certainly would help the abutters greatly. Thank you. It's like the uh, ice cream truck with my kids coming to the neighborhood. The, the entertainer. Okay, dun, 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 dun. Well, I, I know, um, Aaron, you had put in 1030 and you were certainly amenable to using the hours that we had last year. And, and it is kind of one of those situations where the school is right in a residential neighborhood. So part of making this whole thing work is obviously understanding, you know, we're right in the neighborhood and, and we need to be good neighbors. Um, so I, I certainly would recommend going back to last year's hours of, of not later than 10. Uh, it, I would imagine that when the stop time arrives, it's not like all the participants just evaporate. I mean, people generally quietly clear out after a while and so there's some shutdown activities so you know I'm sure the neighborhood is, is feeling it somewhat beyond the official closing time um, what would your thoughts be about having a 930 on those uh, Thursday and Friday and maybe the 10 on Saturday our normal uh, protocol is depending on the size of the crowd anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour before the closing time to stop selling tickets mm -hmm. um, to all the amusement rides mainly so that they can be used up and as you had said leave on a on a timely basis and, and hopefully not so not have a, a mass exodus you know at the closing time and, and everyone leaving at once um, 
I think you know as we you know try to coordinate between you know the police details, obviously uh, you know the crowds for revenue purposes um, to balance it out. Closing at 9:30 would typically be a little earlier, or you know, certainly from what we're what we're used to. Um, you know, I would like to, if if possible, you know, go back to the last year's hours of operation and again assess it. You know, certainly with the neighborhood, and if it you know is continues if it continues to be a, a chronic issue, then certainly we would have to figure out a long-term address for it. But I think making the um, concessions for last year because of the neighborhood concerns. Um, you know, based on what we normally do, and if you know, we can certainly coordinate with the police. You know, detail that's on site that you know, if, if we need to tail back our ticket sales a little bit earlier because of you know crowds to make sure that um, you know they leave you know orderly so that there's not a large influx at the closing hour. We can certainly make you know quick adjustments in that manner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I, yes, sir. The comment about starting early was there No, yeah, so part of the shift from uh, historically carnivals would open at noontime uh, in, in years past and moving to the one o'clock was just based on, on the crowds themselves that most people don't um, typically come out till earlier in the afternoon, you know, about like the two o'clock time frame. So us opening at one is just to, you know, get everything, um, you know, operational and to be ready. But typically, um, you know, on Saturdays with different sports things that are going on in the morning, um, certainly, uh, you know, church events on Sunday and other activities is why we moved to the one o'clock as opposed to going early. It was just to accommodate other community activity. Yeah, it, would, it would seem to me that both uh, Thursday and Friday were at starting at six. If you were to start at 530, you'd kind of be into conflicting with some of the rush hour traffic possibly up on up on Hayden Row. That so might. I'm not being suggest earlier on the weekend. Mm -hmm. so the weekend is the it's just the weekend. It's I think that understanding the, you know, the tradition, I, I'm okay to go back to the old tradition. Sure. Day. That would have an enormously positive effect on the others, and I believe that that would, that would make, for example, the overall interaction. So you would advocate Saturday instead of starting at 1, starting at 12.30? And end at 9:30. Madam Chair, I would suggest we wrap up public comment before we deliberate times that we're going to have open and closed, please. Are there other members of the public who would like to speak? Madam Chair, I move the po we close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That is unanimous. Okay, so the public hearing is closed. That means we can't take new information from the public. We will d discuss amongst ourselves and with the applicant. <coughs> what is the board's pleasure? To the chair. Just a quick question. Um, from a fundraising perspective, do you find that things are dwindling down where that last half hour is not quite as significant as the earlier times? I would say that the last half hour is more significant. Um, similar to what EJ was saying, as a parent, I wait, when my kids were young, I waited to feed them lunch before going out for an afternoon event. And then the older kids, you get the younger crowd earlier in the afternoon. They go home for dinner or nap time, and then the older kids come out, and it's the older kids that typically stay until the later hours. Um, so I, I could see his point as to why they had moved the times back, mm -hmm. just from a parent, like he said, Saturdays are soccer days, so you, you know, you run, you, you get all that done, you go home, you change, everybody eats, and then you head out to whatever you know, fun thing you have planned that day. Um, so I would probably see the later hour being more substantial than the afternoon, but we are willing 
we understand that this is an inconvenience and it is um, so great for our organization and it has been very well received by the town. I volunteer a lot in the schools and this time of year the kids start saying, Miss Graziano, when's the carnival coming? Is the carnival coming back? Um, they, they love it. Um, but so we, we want to find a balance or help to find a balance. Would it be so, Madam Chair, uh, a couple of thoughts. One, um, you know, some of the comments actually from a couple of different discussions we've had tonight from individuals with some passionate concerns. They're very valid concerns as those individuals presented them, I think. Um, but our job is to take those concerns and weigh them against the 17,500 other people and their concerns. And I think that's where it gets a little bit tough, but that's the job. Um, I, I do recall the incident. Oh yeah. I sure do recall right. some emails back and forth, so I'm, I'm a little surprised that there wasn't some level of communication, because I do remember seeing some level of communication about this. So maybe that was amongst us, and I don't recall the details of it, but it was something that came up, and it was something that I thought had been addressed to some extent, obviously not to the satisfaction of the resident, mm -hmm. and that is unfortunate. Um, but I do think in general, uh, the carnival uh, brings a lot of uh, positive energy to the community. Uh, it is Americana 101. It goes all over, goes on all over across America, and uh, goes, all, goes on across America uh, every summer. And as a kid, I remember them, and, and I fully support moving forward with this year's license. Is that a motion? Uh, well, well, if, if I may uh, um, do the chair, I, I think that if if the proponent is not adverse to the at least moving it back to ten o'clock from the ten thirty, let's just let's just Definitely. you know let's start there, um, and and then we can further negotiate. But let's just you know if there is a motion, let's at least start it at at, at ten as opposed to the ten thirty. Through the chair, um, is it possible to maybe just turn it down a little bit when you get when it gets later? Turn the music down just for respect for the neighbors, so uh, it's yeah. not quite as loud. So, you're, and as, as to uh, what one of the the, the, the abutter had mentioned about the music and also its repetition, one of the things that we've added is a computerized sound system. So one. Um, the music changes so that it's not repetitious day in and day out, but also because it's a universal sound system, one click of a button can take it all down. So absolutely, you know, at the nine o'clock mark, we can turn off the sound system so that that last, you know, time is just simply the using of whatever tickets are left, um, you know, as the crowd disperses. Um, that there's no issue in just turning that off that easily. So yes, it, it can be accommodated. Okay. I mean, I'm thinking more you know, as, a, as a carnival goer, you, you kind of want some of the noise, some of the, the well, music. It is part of the activity, but certainly to address, you know, to try and, you know, help the abutters certainly is, you know, with that later time, it's, it, we can be accommodating. So would we be amenable to maybe turning it down at 9 o'clock um, or 9.30? So to accommodate some of the noise concerns? Maybe at 9.30 you make an announcement, you know, the carnival's closing in a half an hour. Please, you know, use up your tickets and maybe you shut the music off at 9.30 mm -hmm. so it gets a little quiet and people get the, get the message. Yeah, so what we, can do, we'll, uh, what we can do is that way, you know, depending on the crowd, we'll time it right with the tickets because the tickets would be pulled at least a half hour. But in the circumstances, if we were to pull them at 45, we'll, do the, we'll mirror the sound to the same ticket policy. So, which would at least be which would at least be a half hour. Right. Somehow, I don't think that the music is the no. only bane of the of the complaint. It, there's, you know, metal crashing on metal and people screaming, and uh, you know, you, you can only do so much. We understand that, but Correct. the fact that you're amenable to do whatever is, we're, you know, certainly. So we're going to limit fun at 9:30 and uh, 9:15. Oh. No, you just start to power <laughs> it down a little bit. Well, <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the yeah. If I make the chair, maybe you know at nine o'clock, kick it down to seventy five percent, nine thirty, twenty five percent, and then and then and keeps make going an down. Or something. Yeah. So yeah. 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 yeah, it has a PA system with it, so <coughs> I don't know how we write that kind of a condition up, but um, okay. So it looks like we're talking about 
uh, returning <coughs> to last year's hours, which were the Thursday 6 to 10, the Friday 6 to 10, uh, the Saturday 1 to 10, and the Sunday 1 to 9, with the understanding that um, in the last, on, on um, Friday and Saturday nights in the last hour before closing, you will make efforts to start to reduce the level of music and sound in that la in, over that last hour. Certainly. Um, we are going to remove item five from last year, which mentioned barricades being erected. That's going to just be handled as part of your interactions with the police in, in the kind of arrangements you make. So the other <coughs> conditions that we had last year, all kind of employees shall be Corey and Surrey certified in accordance with Mass General Law supported by the police chief. The generator shall be located as far from residences as possible. The mobile housing sleeping quarters location shall be coordinated with town officials and shall comply with zoning requirements and rides shall be as far back from the street as possible with the loudest being located in the interior closest to the school building. Um, that's what we had last year with those accommodations for the noise and the hours. Yes. Are there other conditions the board wishes to change, add from last year? I was impressed with <coughs> the length that the, the um, company went to to accommodate the um, the meeting that we had last year and, and the neighbors concerns I was very impressed by the uh, the length at which you addressed those and the fact that they're not up here again uh, is is pretty substantial speaks speaks volumes because those neighbors are not ones to hold their tongue if they have an issue so uh, so congratulations to you guys on that. Yeah, thank you. We're uh, guests in 58 communities over the course of the summer, so we always try to be, a, be, be the best neighbor that we can. Yeah. Well, you're a guest at none better than this one, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, just one question. Um, if there's an issue that comes up, is there a point person, a person to call or does one just call the police, or h how would there be a contact made if someone was aware, like, I got a call from a neighbor or someone about a problem? Do you want a carnival point person or a PTA point person? We, we um, whoever is managing the carnival on site always has my cell phone number, and I always have their cell phone number, and we do communicate often between us, and I know last year, you reached out to me, and right. um, I actually happened to be <laughs> standing with Brendan, and we quickly made you know, <coughs> arrangements to fix the issue. So, um, so I think it would be good, because the select one are the ones that get the call sometimes. Yeah, sure. in, in addition to the police and fire chief having contact information, if the town officials had a point person number, that if we receive some information, there's someone we can call who is on site or able to deal with someone on site to get it addressed. <coughs> Mr. Kamala? For the board's consideration, I suggest that we have uh, contact information for individuals both on the PTA as well as the carnival. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. I have just one other comment, um, question. I noticed in your application it talked about Fiesta Shows contributing like $500 if there was additional parking lot cleaning required. And I think last year what we asked was that that money be, or that check be issued and held in reserve as opposed to trying to having to ask for it sure. afterwards. And then we're discussing does not, does so, does not, does so. Um, I, I would like to see those funds issued and held and then refunded by the town. Not a problem. Do that. All right, um, Mr. Cotino. Would you like me to make a motion? Um, I would like you to make a motion that changes the hours to 10 on those two nights and also accommodates Friday and Saturday during the last hour, reduce, gradually reducing the sound systems. I'd like to propose a motion to approve the entertainment license, a carnival license, and a Sunday license for the HPA, HPTA Fiesta Show Carnival on Thursday, June twentieth, and that's from six to ten p.m. Friday, June twenty-first, six to 
10 p.m. Saturday, June 22nd, 1 to 10 p.m. And Sunday, June 23rd, 1 to 9 p.m. And on Friday and Saturday the, uh, of the last hour, the sound system volume will be gradually reduced. Is there a second? Second. All right. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? That is unanimous. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. And Thank please you. check all the signs and, and everything else and Absolutely. just do a double check yeah. just yeah. to make sure. So, you know, this no is for every year we got to do something. Absolutely. No guarantees in life, but we can certainly make every effort. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. Um, FY20 budget update. The town manager will update the Board of Selectmen on the fiscal year 20 budget, including the Appropriations Committee hearings. The chair of the Appropriations Committee will be present to discuss specific budget issues. So, Mr. Kamalo, and I see Mr. Connolly is here as well to give us the final rundown, because tonight's the night. Um, through the chair, there are two changes to the budget that I would like to report to the board since the last update to, to the board was made by the town manager. Um, on the operating budget side, the park and rec subsidy has been reduced from 157000 down to 148,981. And then in terms of capital projects, you'd recall the board had a discussion regarding the request uh, to fund phase two of the sidewalk master plan. Subsequent to the board's discussion of this request, we have also met with the appropriations committee I received specific feedback from the Appropriations Committee. Whilst my understanding is that the Appropriations Committee does support the request as presented, taking into account the responses or the feedback that we received from some members of the Appropriations Committee, as well as the feedback from the Board of Selectmen, we are now proposing to reduce that request down to 800,000. That's down from what? 1.5 million. 1.5 to 800,000. On sidewalks? Yes. And specifically, we eliminated, I believe, and John is here to provide details, we eliminated two sidewalks that were of concern to the board. One was the West Main, mm -hmm. and the other one was me. Wild Rose. Yeah, Wild Rose. Street. Again? We cut that sidewalk out again two years in a row? Going to nowhere. No, you're downtown. Sidewalk. You're downtown. Wild Road? No, I'm talking about West Main Street. No, it was Main Street. It was no, it, yeah, it's West Main Street. Yes. And Rose. West Main Street gets cut every single year. The other side of town, we, we're buying another another tractor so the downtown area can get cleared, to get the snow blow, can get the snow off the sidewalks. And all they do in, 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 uh, up in my, my town, the side of the world, is they put the snow on the sidewalks. And wherever there are, happen to be sidewalks, any of the main roads, there are no sidewalks coming down West Main Street at all. No way to get, no way to get underneath the uh, 495. Are we in deliberation mode, Madam Chair? Sorry. We might as well be. <laughs> no, but but uh, but I want to know. But could, could if I may through the chair, could I ask? Could I ask what changes in the budget? If you just go through the changes from the one that we signed off two weeks ago. Uh, the, the just just list those things because you know what what other things got cut out so other things can get in. Again, the the two changes that I identified are the changes that we are reporting to the board. These were not um, the 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 changes were not done to accommodate any new things in the budget. They were simply, the adjustments were made in response to the feedback that we received, as well as in terms of the park and rec, um, the change is based on the, um, 
the, the accounting process that we've put in place um, for the enterprise revenue. Well, I remember the sidewalk discussion, and I, I, I'm glad Wild Road is gone, because we talked about it as kind of being a sidewalk to nowhere. I'm all for sidewalks, but I'm all for s spending our money on the areas where the need is. But I didn't remember uh, controversy over the West Main Street at all. I remembered Mr. Tedstone and I both discussed the Hayden Row because there was going to be sidewalks, there was already sidewalk on one side of the road, and we said, why do we need sidewalks on both sides of the road where there are parts of town that don't have any sidewalk that need it? So, I mean, I don't mind reducing it. I wasn't opposed to the, the amount that we had initially, but my issue was putting the, spending it where it's needed, and I don't recall that West, that West Main Street was the problem. I thought it was Hayden Road. Agreed. Uh, again, as I said in my remarks, we took into account feedback from the Board of Selectmen as well as the Appropriations Committee. Absolutely correct that the Selectmen were in support of the West Main Street. The feedback that we received from some members of the Appropriations Committee um, was not in favour of that West Main Street sidewalk. So, excuse can, me, let's, can we just get some facts here real quick, yeah. if I could? Parks and Rec, are they okay with this minor reduction? The Parks and Rec Commission elected officials, our colleagues. Y y yes, okay, they are. Thank you. So yeah. we're all good there, right? Okay. Good. That's fine. Yeah. Sidewalks. What sidewalk are we talking about eliminating on West Main Street? Give me the facts. Connecting down East Street. But East there is East sidewalks East on West Main Street. So where on West Main Street no, are we talking? No, it's, here? it's connecting 110 and the and the and the Muse to Price Chopper. Can I ask Mr. Wesseling, please? Where are we talking about? Good evening, through the chair. I'll break down the four, if that'll be helpful. Um, the West Main Street specifically is 4,200 feet of sidewalk that stretches from approximately Lumber Street to Downey Street, and that is $960,000. Okay, hold on right there. Is there any sidewalk on either side of West Main Street in that area right now? No, sir. So I run through there all the time. Um, it's underneath 495, it's underneath the bridge. There's, there's space, but not a sidewalk. Okay. And not on either side. All right, thank you. What else? Uh, the Wild Road section was 200 feet, and that is $40,000. Hayden Row Street, which would extend down the easterly side from EMC Park to Chestnut Street, 3,800 feet at $700,000. And the last one is Wood Street, which would run on the easterly side from Proctor Street to the, uh, to the new DPW building and extend to the sidewalks that we constructed in front of the church, and that's at 100,000. And those last two are still in, it's those first two we mentioned. Correct. How and long is the Proctor Street span? Excuse me? How long is the Wood Street from Proctor to the DPW? 500 feet. 500. So, so if I could, Madam Chair, West Main Street, if you put a sidewalk in, you are still crossing 495 <coughs> entrances and exits. You are. So That's we're putting true. a sidewalk in a pretty dangerous part of town. I mean, I, literally, I run through there all the time. And, you know, you've got to run fast, which I don't do anymore, uh, <laughs> to avoid getting hit. Putting a sidewalk in there is not going to change that. It's just going to be a marking in the road, and people are still going to come flying down those ramps. So that's a very expensive, dangerous sidewalk. But it does not give the people in that Lumber Street area, like the Mews, any way to walk from that area to the Price Chopper Plaza. I mean, there's no. That's what I'm saying. Is if you put a sidewalk the in there, they're still taking their life in their hands going across those 495. On if, if I may respond to the chair, the, it's the same as, as um, Milford. Milford <coughs> has their bike trail that goes, cuts right across 495, right, under, right underneath 495, past, past four, uh, four interchanges, and it, and, 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 and it works. And I run through there and it's dangerous. <laughs> I ride, I've ridden my bike through there, so. So the choice is you have no access at all, or you have access that requires someone to be alert, but at least they have a sidewalk to walk on as opposed to what, the grass shoulder? I mean, Donnie Street has no sidewalk con connectivity to get up to the shopping center. I think that was the idea, that that lake area, that, that section could be connected to these businesses. For, for, for me, it's a million dollar investment in a tough place to put a sidewalk. 
It is tough. I'm okay. With, I like sidewalks. You have to watch out. But where we put them and our cash flow and when we do these things is really what's the discussion here. So we're, we're trying to figure out how to work the budget for 2020. We've got this $900,000 item in play and we're, I, I think we're, we're stretching it to put it in a tough spot. I don't disagree with what you're saying that it's a tough spot, but um, based on my experience in Milford, um, it puts the drivers on notice that there are people crossing, there are people using this area. Because when I ride my bike down uh, West Main Street by 495, I have the same issue where you're constantly checking and quickly dart over. Um, when you, at least in Milford, you have that crosswalk and people are aware, okay, I need to look out, I need to be careful. So it, it's difficult, yes, but I think it does make it safer. If, Weighing if I, the, the cost factor, I mean, that, that certainly uh, weighs heavily uh, against, but uh, I think we do, need to, we do need pedestrian access and bike access going through that stretch. Um, so the cost for the, the uh, sidewalk on West Main Street, $960,000. So Milford didn't just put a sidewalk through 495. I'm sure they did a traffic study and a second traffic study, and then they get beacons and lights and, and everything that's going along with it. Does this $960,000 include signage and lights for 495 and and items to make drivers aware and items to make people walking aware that there may or may not be a car approaching at 50 to 70 miles an hour. Through the chair, it absolutely does. It does. So that, that 960,000, in theory, duplicates what Milford has along 495 at Route 85 on their bike trail. If not better. And that's why the, the per foot cost is so much more expensive for that section of roadway because there's elevated sidewalk under 495, there's a lot of wetland issues there, and there's also the need to make sure that we have the adequate traffic controls. Uh, follow up, if we okay this today, does that sidewalk plan lock Mr. Westerling into doing Hayden Row and Wood Street and not Wild Road in West Main? Or does it simply give him X amount of dollars, would we say $900,000 or whatever it was, to do sidewalks? D depending on the number that the board supports. The board's approval comes along with a locked in plan. In other words, okay. if it's Wood Street and Hayden Row, then that's, that's what he will do. So I'm fearing that by me going down this this road and asking these questions, it's going to imply that I'm getting into doing your day-to-day -day job, and I'm not. I'm just thinking out loud. I actually was, but I caught myself. Like someone may or may not have texted me. Is this going to be bonded uh, or is this cash? Bonded. Bonded? Yes. Okay, so the million that I was arguing about is not a full million, it's the debt service on the million. So. I have to confess, I, I understand that the Board of Selectmen had one opinion on the sidewalks and appropriations had another. I don't, appropriations looks at the expenditures, but there's Mr. Manning raising his hand. I kind of thought it was the Board of Selectmen's job to do the town planning oversight it is. part of it, that those types of decisions on where these things would be placed would be this Board's purview. Mr. Manning. Uh, thank you. I just want to make it clear that the Appropriations Committee, um, we discussed uh, not spending perhaps $1.8 on sidewalks, but we did not have specific uh, pieces to say do this or not do that. That We, we had no uh, group discussion on that. It was strictly, you know, one point, it was, I believe it was $1.8 million that we were discussing, and that's an awful lot given the stresses of this budget and we're not even paying for it in this year's budget. It's going to be ongoing years as it's a borrowing that we were just concerned. That's a lot of money in this budget climate. But we did not specific, and we thought maybe it would be easier to do if it was a smaller amount. But we did not specific, we did not even know the costs of the specific uh, strips of, of sidewalk. I just Thank want to clarify. Thank you for clarifying that. That makes more sense to me. <laughs>
Madam Chair, the other point I would make specific to this sidewalk, and I think one of my colleagues mentioned it, is well, we got to connect the Muse to Price Chop. Right. Why is it our responsibility and not the developer's responsibility to foot the bill to connect the residents that he developed for to services that they are interested in? Somewhere along the way, we missed, we missed an opportunity here, I think, a little bit. Um, Legacy put in all kinds of sidewalks, we brought sidewalks to the center of town. I don't know why that we're, we're, the taxpayers are across the community <coughs> are paying a million dollars over a period of time to connect sidewalks in a very dangerous place unless we start building tunnels um, that really I think developers should have covered. Well, I understand your point, but I can also respond in two ways. Um, one is that I think there's a certain responsibility on the part of the town to provide connectivity for its residents to all the various amenities in various parts of the town um, and to provide amenities that will keep our residents safe. Um, and I also recall that not too many years ago, there was a planning board decision that had to do with Golden Pond. And uh, we asked that developer to do just what you're discussing, to provide sidewalk connectivity for those residents up to some of the shopping that was available up at the Lumber Street intersection, um, that that should be built by the developer. And that was appealed, and it did not go in the favor of the town. Um, the developer was ruled not to be responsible, that that was arbitrary and capricious. So um, I love to see other people pay for things that, that uh, benefit the town, but it doesn't always work that way. If I may. Mr. Kamal. Just to clarify the point that was made by Mr. Hare. Um, I was directly involved in the negotiations of the HCA um, with the Mules developer. Uh, the town did push for sidewalks, mm -hmm. but because that was a 40B project, we lost that request. Mm, thank you. Yeah. And to, to the chair, we, you know, we have to also look at it from the point of view of the Chamber of Commerce. You know, if, if people have more access to, to shops and, and uh, restaurants and everything else, that they, they may utilize them a lot more, you know, to, to, you know, to allow, um, you know, um, kids to ride their bikes from, from that area to, to Price Chopper or to any of the restaurants or, or no, just the liquor store, but, uh, but you know, it just, uh, just gives people another, another, another way of, of being able to, to get to that stuff. And the people from Downey Street also, it's, that's, that's also tough, you know, coming from the lake area. To be able to, to to walk to Price Chopper or something else, it's it's you know it, it's it's I see it as a, as a need that I've noticed since I came here over 20 years ago. I, I guess the way I see it is that it, it is it is a dangerous stretch of road, but it's more dangerous if there's nothing at all. So you know people are still going to attempt it. Hoppington News has a lot of kids there. Um, you know, would you rather have them just going completely on their own, walking in the road or walking on the grass shoulder, or, you know, give some, some degree of safety? It's not perfect. A lot of things aren't perfect, but um, it would be an improvement, I think. So. But I don't agree that we need the one on Hayden Row. I'd like, I'd like to switch that money around do the West Main Street and take out that that duplication on Hayden Road, but that's that's just is that in our purview to do, to decide? Yes. Again, um, it needs to be said that the sidewalks that are being discussed were identified as part of a very inclusive. A public process conducted by the planning board. There was a needs assessment and there was a plan that was then developed. And as part of working out the financing for implementing the plan, we came up with a two-phased program. Mm -hmm. Phase one was funded. Uh, we've been asking, I think, for the last two, three years to fund phase two. Uh, I am at least excited that the board is discussing the opportunity at least to fund a portion of phase two. 
So can you tell me again, what's the cost of the Hayden Row piece and what's the cost of the of the West Main Street if we were to do one, switch one for the other? 260000 net more for West, West Main. 700000 for Hayden Row and, and 100000 for, for Wood. Yeah. And nine sixty for West Main, Madam yeah. Chair. West, seven, what? Seven hundred and one hundred, and Wild was forty. No, I don't care about Wild. So Hayden Row was seven hundred, and the West Main was how much? Nine hundred sixty. Nine sixty. So that's two hundred sixty more than the other one. Well. What was the cost on Wild Road? Two. Uh, um, terribly sorry. Four, Forty thousand. So what would this do to your budget, Mr. Camalo, if we if we uh, decided to drop the Hayden Row and do the West Main for another 260? That would throw everything off at this point. No, we're bonding it. Um, no, I, I think it's it will still be consistent with the feedback that we received from the Appropriations Committee, namely find a way to perhaps bring that number down. However, I still need to make the pitch for head and roll. Um, we have expanded the school campus along head and roll. Whilst I understand the observation that we already have a sidewalk on one side of the road, we have the school campus now on both sides of head and roll. And I think for that reason, it's important that we continue to look for opportunities to build the sidewalk on the easterly side of head and roll. As the uh, anti-sidewalk candidate this evening, um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm fully in support of Hayden Row because that is a concentration of kids and parents that will use that sidewalk. I am fully opposed to West Main Street because I think the usage of that sidewalk for a million dollars will be very low given its proximity and crossing of 495. All right, so. I was leaning more towards <clears throat> Mr. Catino, um, you know, being from that neighborhood, there really aren't that many services and blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> but I was totally against the Hayden Row simply because we have a side rock, sidewalk 20 feet across the street. Now, I understand what you're saying about the school. The school is kindergarten and first grade. Mm -hmm. If there are parents that are allowing their kindergarten and first grader to walk down Route 85, um, I think that DCF may or may not get involved in something like that. So uh, that argument means nothing to me. Thank you. The fact that you, <laughs> the fact that you live in Mr. Catino's similar in, the, in that neighborhood, you're not fighting for that. That means more to me. The cheap person in me in town says, I'm all set with both, with all of them. Let's just uh, we can just do Wood Street and save. Mr. Nesbo is also up, up in that side of town too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he hasn't said anything yet. So I would be in support of uh, Mr. Catino's approach, um, and as well as uh, Mr. Tedson. I, I don't see a great need for. Uh, Hayden Row, we already have one there. As far as prioritizing, I think uh, West Main Street would be number one. But of course, I'm in that part of the town, so there's, there is a slight bias. So um, I don't see a need for Wild Road. <coughs> and uh, I think Wood Street could wait also if I were to prioritize. Okay. Clear as mud. Clear as mud. Through the chair. Please, Mr. Kamala. Regarding Wood Street, the overall goal is to connect the center trail to a destination uh, in town, our new destination in town, namely the Foot Street Fields. And we're doing this portion by portion. And eventually, we're looking for a connection from Main Street all the way down to the Foot Street Fields. No one will argue that Fruit Street Fields is becoming a destination in town. 
Well, maybe not everyone will argue. <laughs> but I will. Whenever you say no one will argue, I will always argue. Yeah. <laughs> say we have a cutting edge turf field at the high school that already has sidewalks to it. I take my comment back. <laughs> I agree that Fruit Street is a destination, yeah. but I question how many people are really going to walk from downtown to the Fruit Street fields. I think that's the, the, the drive, parents are driving. Again, um, we, we can debate this over and over. I will tell you. One of, the, one of the aspects of this community that I really enjoy is when I drive into town or I drive out of town, the number of people that I see on the street, not in cars, walking, running, cycling. It's a, that constituency is a significant component of this community. There are many people who walk and who run in this community. Not on West Main Street. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but I think it, ne it needs to be said that I, I keep hearing that people won't use sidewalks. I can tell you, when we built the sidewalks on Ash Street, we received very many positive comments from the community uploading that investment. Mm -hmm. Can I make a motion? Make a motion. I move that we fund the $100,000 for the sidewalk from Wood Street to Proctor Street. I mean, on, from Proctor Street to the DPW, approximately 500 feet for $100,000. And that's it. I would be welcome a second. If anyone would like to second that. <laughs> Hearing none, that was a nice try. All right, to there you go. Good effort. <laughs> I'll give it a go. Madam Chair, I move that the Board of Selectmen support uh, through debt service uh, or whatever term we want to use for the, for the motion this morning, um, the development and construction of a sidewalk on Hayden Row Street uh, submitted by the DPW Director uh, and Wood Street as submitted by the DPW Director for FY20. <laughs> that went over well, too. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to support the building of a sidewalk um, along West Main Street uh, past the uh, and under 495. Only? No, no, the other one's just that one? Um, Actually, I'd like to fund them all, but I'm just asking for that one at this point. So you're going to only, only motion to... S People can add other motions afterwards. I'm going to second that. Okay. Are there any, is there any debate or any amendments to that? Okay, the motion on the table is to... S fund the section of sidewalk along West Main Street only. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? No. That motion carries by a vote of three to two. Madam Chair, I move that the Board of Select and support the uh, request of the DPW Director to construct the sidewalk along Woods, Wood Street through a debt service. Second. Discussion. All those in favor? Um, no. Okay. Yep. <laughs> quick. Speak up quick. It's not as that. It's not as though I don't support um, sidewalk uh, uh, on the Wood Street portion. Um, it's just that if we're going to be taking on such a large portion under West Main Street, maybe we ought to wait a year for Wood Street. I do think Wood Street's a sidewalk to nowhere right now. It's going to be for a long time. But. So, just wanted to put that out there. I am in support, but I, I think later. And again, the price tag on the Wood Street one is? 100. Though. That's 100. Okay. Was that, was that seconded? You made the motion. Seconded. seconded? Okay. 
Okay, the motion has been made and seconded to also fund the construction of sidewalk on Wood Street um, from Proctor Street to the DPW for $100,000. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? No. Two no, three yes. Okay. All right. So what's the last combination? Um, <laughs> Spill a lot of money. I move that the Board of Selectmen support the DPW's director to construct uh, the sidewalk uh, through a borrowing along Hayden Row as submitted. I think sufficient time has passed. You're going to try that already? <laughs> okay. We tried that already. Well, okay. I, had a com I had a combined with Wood Street. So. Okay. Still didn't work. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the two are the Wood Street and the Wentz Main Street. You all set, Mr. Kamala? Are you all set? Yes. Fine, except that Haiti and is not moving forward. <laughs> I, I, we will continue to look for grant opportunities. I, I understand, um, I, again, I travel on that road. It's not only kids who are going to the marathon school, it's also kids who are going to the other schools coming from that, the other side of town. Well, there is one sidewalk, so perhaps this is one that could be pushed off till next year. It's not like it's an area without any sidewalk, whereas these two other ones have nothing at all. So, Madam Chair. Mr. D Mr. DPW. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, just to follow up on Mr. Kamalo's comment, uh, I did speak with Ben Sweeney. We are going to look for additional funding sources for that section of Hayden Row. There is a safe roads to school, safe routes to school program, so we're going to look for other funding sources that are available. Okay. All right. Even better. Thank, Thank you. you. We need to. Nice job. Thank you, Mr. DPW. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, was that, so that's, is that it on the budget update, Mr. Kamala? Oh, Mr. Manning? Yeah, the Appropriations Committee Chair is here to okay. share with Mike. the board an update on the Appropriation Committee's review of the FY20 budget. Okay, sorry what we just did to you, but. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, before I start, I just want to mention that I live off a of wild road, so. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Join my team. <laughs> so, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for letting the Appropriation Committee speak in front of the Board of Selectmen. As the Appropriation Committee deliberates the budget and capital articles, we have made a few observations and would like to comment on a few points. Overall, we are relatively pleased with this year's budget. Per Board of Selectmen request, the Town Manager and Finance Team have found budget items where the expenses and estimates could be adjusted to reduce the overall tax impact to 2.5%. We have met with department heads to discuss their operational budget and capital requests, and we understand the need for increased services due to overall population growth in town and in the schools. There are two issues that the committee wishes to bring to the Board of Selectmen's attention tonight. First, the town of Hopkinton has been fortunate to have the availability, the availability of free cash this year to pay for many of our expenses. This year we continue to fund OPEB at $400,000. However, this is about half the amount specified in the OPEB actuarial valuation report. Level contribution should be $851,000. The analysis of the actuarial report was updated last year, and although the actual funding this year is equal compared to last year's funding, the town is not on track to eliminate the town's unfunded $28 million liability. Because of the tight budget, our OPEB contribution will be underfunded this year. The contribution should be at least $624,000, which assumes a 3% increase in contribution each following year. By not funding per the actuarial report, we continue to kick the can down the road to our future Hopkinton taxpayers. Recommended OPEB funding is calculated based on work by town employees performed today, not future work. Just like salary, salary paid to employees, funding to OPEB should be required, not the first line item cut each year in our budget. The Appropriation Committee would like to see full funding in this budget. Next, 
I want to bring attention to this year's funding sources, specifically free cash. In previous budgets, we have been using our free cash to fund snow and ice deficits and pay capital pay-as-you-go items. This year's pay-as-you-go items include DPW vehicles, police cruisers, and renovations. However, this year, roughly $235,000 of our free cash is funding the operational budget. This concerns the Appropriation Committee. Although not yet a trend, this is the first year in my recollection that the town is utilizing free cash to fund personnel and reoccurring expenses that make up the operational budget. We have modeled the next two years of budgets and do not see us easily getting out of this cycle. We've been fortunate that we have had sizable free cash accumulations over the past few years, but if there is a downturn economically or an extra large snow expense, we won't have the continued flexibility that we have enjoyed in the past if we rely on fee free cash to fund salaries. In summary, the Appropriations Committee is relatively pleased with this year's budget, but we continue to keep a watch out for potential budget issues down the road as we want to see stable and sustainable budgets in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. If I may. Mom, please. Mike, thank you for those comments. Um, I, I've been with the town for 10 years and I was instrumental in developing the financial policies for the town. Uh, whilst uh, I do share your concerns with regard to the funding for OPEB, uh, as well as the, the global overarching concern regarding the use of free cash, I would encourage the Appropriations Committee to really look at the details um, of where, when, and how we are applying free cash uh, to fund the operating budget. I specifically do not recall any aspect of the budget where we are using free cash to pay for salaries. Um, whilst the idea of not using free cash to, um, to fund the operating budget is, is an acceptable, I think, guideline. I, I do not see it as an immutable dogma. I, 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 I'm, looking and I'm looking for opportunities to, to find ways as to how we can refine that policy. Uh, we put it together many years ago. What I have learned over the years is that the practical dictates and the realities that we face here in Hopkinton have inspired us to be very, very creative in, in how we move the budget forward. And I think it's the democratic process that has in many instances opened up channels where we find ourselves redirecting um, our funding sources. For example, we went into this budget process firm on the idea that we're going to start moving some of the, what we consider ongoing commitments, um, such as the uh, police vehicles, um, ongoing maintenance issues into the operating budget. But the reality, the practical needs, and also the comments that we received through the democratic process led us in a different direction. By the end of the day, when I look at the decisions that have been made regarding the use of free cash, I make the following observations. The process is democratic. The process is thoughtful, it is not whimsical, um, and most importantly, it's laying the foundations for a future discussion on how we refine that policy. Overall, I do agree with you in terms of we need to provide more funding for OPEB. Overall, I do agree with you that the overarching guideline is not to use free cash uh, for ongoing expenses. However, if, if your observation is correct that we are funding salaries, because I don't, re I don't recall that, if that's the case, we need to fix that. 
if I may, for the chair. Please. So it's not specific to salaries or not, but it's not, typically we haven't used this free cash to what is in the operational budget. Uh, for instance, we, yes, we did try at first to get the police cruisers, or even for the last couple of years, I've been trying to get OPEB yeah. in the, in, just in the operational budget, because it shouldn't be whatever, that's kind of my first point that, okay, if we have any free cash left, let's, let's use it to pay whatever we can to OPEB. So it should be a line item in the regular operational budget year over year. But it, and I think we have been fortunate, just, I think when I started, if we had 500,000 in free cash, that was, that was terrific. And now I think uh, the norm is $2 million or, or whatever it is. So it's, it's actually, at, that's very good. But can we, now we're gonna start, it seems like we're gonna rely on it of what's in, in that part of the operational budget. Typically, at least from appropriations perspective, you know, we use it for pay-as-you-go or stabilization accounts. That's what we'd use the free cash for. And if it was a little light this year, then maybe we'd only get one cruiser, two cruisers, or hold back on one of the other trucks that we need, push that back a year, and we have that kind of flexibility. So it really just concern that even, even though out of the, all the free cash we had, it wasn't, you know, 235000 wasn't, you know, using a large portion of it, but it, it's starting a... A, a not a trend that I'd hope not to see down the road and, and as you, Mr. Kamalo as you're talking that we'd like to see alternatives to that down the road I think that's a good idea but I just wanted to bring that attention that the the, the appropriations committee wasn't particularly comfortable with going down that route you know a couple of comments that we've had as a committee is that this is like what we've had tons of new growth this is this is one of our better years if not one of the best years going forward in terms of of you know, revenue coming in because of the new growth and, and what is the trend going down the road? If we are having trouble now with this year's budget, are we going to be having problems down the road? And that's, that's what we're looking down for. It's not just this year's budget, but being prepared down the road. And, you know, we are conservative, whether it's the Board of Selectmen or the Appropriations Committee, we are pretty conservative on our budgeting and, and we don't want to run uh, in the wrong direction, but we just want to bring that to your attention. I have a question to, to the chair, to, to either the, uh, uh, Mike or to Mr. Kamalo. You know, and it's commendable that we got to 2.5 percent, but did we did we get to the 2.5 from the 2.97 or whatever it was because we broke some of these rules that we want to stick to? Because if it if it's really meaningless to hit the 2. Point, the 2.5. But we're moving stuff around that's unnecessary. Pockets in the pants. Yeah, well, if we're just that's moving pockets, pocket. let's just be honest with ourselves and say, look, we're at 2.72 this year, but we didn't break any rules. You know, is that the way we want to do it? If I may, firstly, when we presented the budget for the first time to the selectmen, the feedback that we received acknowledged that the expenses were going up substantially. And the charge that was given to us was to go and identify ways of using our sources to fund the expanding or increasing budget. So clearly, the instruction that was given to us was go find creative ways of using our diverse funding sources to make this budget work. That's the instruction that I believe I, I heard from the board. And then in terms of how we got there, we used a menu. In fact, it was two strategies. There were instances where we actually reduced budgets. There were, so instances, there were also instances where we then moved funding sources mm -hmm. away from taxation to free cash. In doing so, we had two broad categories that we focused on. We focused on what I consider capitalization, whether it's ongoing maintenance or buying equipment uh, that is needed for some, in some instances for our ability to operate, but it's still capitalization. So that was one grouping. The other grouping was clearly <coughs> what, what we have always referred to as the pay-as-you-go projects. So in answer to your question, we use the combination of cut expenditures, but at the same time also move funds around. Right, but, but what, what I'm getting to is, it, it sounds like we, we 
um, broke precedent from stuff that you never wanted to do and you never wanted to do just to meet a, an, an edict that came down from the Board of Selectmen. You know, and, and, and I don't know, I, I, I don't know, I, I didn't, uh, I know Mr. I can't speak for the rest of them, but I didn't want you guys to have to change um, your, your basic practices in order to meet this guideline. We, through the chair, <coughs> we did not, we did not break any principle. Of your own yes, principles? Yes, exactly. we, we, we did not. What we didn't do was to start transitioning to what we believe is the ideal situation. Tax for capital projects, tax for ongoing expenditures where, which involve capitalization, uh, and also tax for OPEP. Uh, there's also been the observation that we should tax for funding the snow and ice deficit. These are items that normally would be considered as part of the operating budget. What we did was to then find or continue what we've done before. So this is why I'm answering your question this way. Continue doing what we've done before. Use free cash to fund that. Okay. 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 Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks, Mike. Okay. All right. Uh, anything more on the budget, Mr. Kamalo? Um, we all set on that? No, I think we're all set. Unless if uh, there's anything else. I think we're good. So can we just get a quick summary of where we are as of tonight? Because this is it before town meeting, this correct? This is it. This is so what's, give, what's the bottom line? I know we got a couple of little adjustments based on some debt service changes right now through the sidewalks, but where are we in general? Can, can I just ask one question before you that one? Because yes. it involves it. Yeah. Is uh, the um, uh, Hopkinton Day all set for, for next year? We're good to go. Um, we will have the party. Okay, just yes. want to make sure because uh, walking out of church, I get asked. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, uh, uh, to Mr. Hess' question, the the overall tax impact um, is now met at 2.5 percent. Um, we uh, got there, I think, in, as I said earlier, uh, by adjusting both the funding sources as well as some of the expenditures. So overall, we have, mo we have met the board's uh, <coughs> And all our colleagues across the various departments are in reasonably good shape and agreeable to what we're doing? My understanding is yes, and the school committee chair is here, so is the superintendent, Dr. Kavanaugh. OK. Um, and then how about the number that's going to be on the ballot for the underride? Is that set? That number has not changed. Has not changed. Yes. <clears throat> I don't believe there's an opportunity to change it because that's what was voted and the ballots have been printed. Correct. Mm -hmm. So to say it's not changed, it, it cannot change. Yeah. Well, we had, we had yeah. some discussion about exactly. it, moving it a little bit as we got closer, but now that it's set, it's set. It's, it, it's set. Yeah. As long as it's what we talked about, it's good. Dollar or nothing. Okay. All right. Moving along? Yes. All right. Um, we have the 2019 annual town meeting. Uh, the Board of Selectmen will sign the final annual, annual town meeting warrant. We'll finalize motions, take positions on articles, and we'll discuss its town meeting presentations. And we have the warrant, and there are quite a number of articles that we have to make a recommendation on. So, um, the so this is the actual sheet right here. Yeah, yes. That's my own here. here. So, what is what is this that you're passing to me? What is this? Yeah. Uh, uh, this is the list of articles the, oh, that the board okay. still needs to react on. I made a, I made a list too. Okay, so let's start by going through the articles that we need to take a position on. Um, uh, okay, so, Article 2, Supplemental Appropriation and transfers required recommendations. Um, so moved. All right. Second. 
Moved and seconded. Okay. Moved and seconded um, to support. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That is unanimous. Okay. Uh, next for our approval is Article 10. This is the FY 2020 operating budget. Madam Chair, can I suggest that we just put a standing motion on the table in the affirmative for each one of these articles as we reach it, and we can just take the vote without having to get moves, motions and seconds? I'll second that if we have to. That's done. So, so, then I, so what are you saying then, that we just go ahead and automate, just do a blanket approval of all these? No, there's a motion on the table for all the, all the articles that we're going to so We don't have to make a motion and second. Take a vote on each one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is that... Do I need to vote Ex that, Mr. Uh, well, I seconded it. Okay. All right. So the motion is to take a standing vote of approval, and then we will just, we won't have to go through a, a motion a second each time. All those in favor of Mr. Hurst's suggestion, please say aye. 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 And opposed. That is unanimous. Okay. Article 10, Fiscal 2021 oper uh, 2020 Operating Budget. Aye. 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 Approved. Article 15, this is establishment of the school department stabilization fund, acceptance of fourth paragraph of MGL, chapter 40, section 58. If I may. Mr. Kamal. Um, by way of introduction, um, we've been working with our colleagues from the school side to uh, formulate this article as presented in the uh, warrant as well as the uh, motions document. Uh, I believe at this point there is final un agreement and understanding that this is the article moving forward. Uh, it is a four part article. Uh, the first part establishes the school department stabilization fund uh, to be used upon further appropriation and at the direction of the school committee for the purposes of paying school department costs related in all or in a significant part is reasonably determined <coughs> by the school committee um, to address impacts on the Hopkinton Public Schools resulting from enrollment by residents of legacy farms. That's step number one. Number two, I would be asking town meeting to allow the dedication without further appropriation of all or a percentage not less than 25 percent. And then step three, uh, dedicating a percentage not less than 25% of all receipts from any private source, including any receipts accepted pursuant to the Legacy Farms Host Community Agreement. And then finally, raising and appropriating uh, a specific amount that will be available for use by the school committee uh, in FY20. Uh, as you'll see in the motion, that amount has been set at 200000 Question? Okay. So, it's <clears throat> so if I understand this correctly, um, this would just automatically give that money without any oversight? Uh, I'm sorry, without the Board of Selectmen's oversight? No. Or am I, I let, let me explain the process. <clears throat> if you're looking for whether there will be a specific vote by the selectmen, um, that's not intended in this process. The overall oversight is established through a town meeting. Town meeting sets, votes to set the stabilization fund. Town meeting votes to put money into the stabilization fund. Town meeting votes to take money out of the stabilization fund at the direction and the control by the school committee. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? All right. All those in favor of, artic of uh, recommending Article 15? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Um, next is Article 17, Pay As You Go, Capital Expenses. A motion to recommend? Or, uh, oh, we already oh. had the motion. <laughs> All those in favor of supporting Article 17? Aye. 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 Okay. 
Okay. Close that is meaningless. Okay. Um, <laughs> Article 18 is purchase of valve maintenance trailer system. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous? The old VMTS. Uh, that's right. Article 19 is purchase of a water department truck. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Article 20, purchase of a bucket truck. Mr. Marlow, that's your bucket truck. All those in favor, uh, is there discussion or? Nope. Okay. okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Article 21, the purchase of a multi-purpose municipal tractor. All those in favor please say aye. 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 Opposed, that is unanimous. Article 22, sewer comprehensive wastewater management plan update. Motion to recommend? All those in favor say aye. 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 That's a good one. I know that's a big one. Unanimous. Okay, Article 23. This <laughs> sidewalk <coughs> management plan phase two. So we're vo what we're voting right now, Mr. Kamala, will be the recommendations that we just made at this meeting. Correct. Wood okay. Street and West Main Street. All right. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor of recommending, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, that is four <laughs> to one. Okay, <laughs> it carries. Article 25, purchase of a ladder truck. And this is going to be bonded. And so it's also going to be on the ballot as question, as question two on the ballot. Um, all those in favor to recommend purchase of the ladder truck say aye. 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 Opposed? No opposition. Okay, Article 26. What was that one before the one? That was, uh, no, that was unit. Ladder truck was unanimous. Yeah, okay. But the sidewalk was four to one. Right. You voted against it. Yep. Okay. Um, Article 26 public safety software upgrade. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Article 27, town hall basement renovation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Article 28, security cameras for the school. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, Article 29, Center School Renovation and Reuse Feasibility Study. All those in favor say aye. 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 Is that unanimous? Yes. Okay, unanimous. Yep. Article 30, Community Preservation Funds. All those in favor of recommending say aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Article 45. Article 45 is the Kennel Licensing Bylaw. Oh, wait a minute. 40. Um, I have, on, on the board, Mr. Kamala, I have that as Article 44. I think it says 45. Uh, that, which one? Is, um, yeah, maybe in the board. 44 is yeah. that change yeah. of selectmen to select board one. No. So, I just want to confirm. I think we may be looking at that been dropped. I do not think that that has been dropped. No, what I, what I, I have 43 is the change to select board, yeah. and I have 44 is the kennel licensing. Yeah, well, I have 45. Sorry, you, you may, you your may have an older version. Um, your the current version is 45. Today. Yes, the one we just gave. Well, the one I gave you today has yes, been superseded right. by the one we distributed. Yes, the one that was here yes. on the, on the Okay, because I had my notes, so I'm using the one. So it's now Article 45. So 45. excuse me for being confused, but if that's Article 45, then what is now, what's now Article 44 in the new one? Yeah, F 44 is... It's the select, oh, yeah, select, select board. board. Selectman. It's not a select board. It's 
the selectmen. And so that was 43 <laughs> before. So has something been added in 43? <laughs> the numbers aren't adding up. Yes. There's two the, yes. The, the, the planning board had asked that one of its uh, articles be removed. Okay. They then came back and asked that the um, article be reinserted. Yes. Okay, that's okay. All right. Get the numbers right before Tommy. Okay, so it is now Article 45. It's Cattle Licensing Bylaw. Um, all those in favor of recommending, please aye. say aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed. That is unanimous. Okay. Article 49 is the Fruit Street lease. All those in favor? What is this, Madam Chair? I'm sorry. This is a request to increase that lease on the Fruit Street land for a youth organization not to exceed 99 years. Okay. I think it was initially less, like 50. And yeah. yeah. I keep feeling that wasn't mm -hmm. realistic. So the 99 is what's changed from what we voted at 27, in 2017. Okay. Okay, Fruit Street lease. All those in favor of recommending say aye. 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 Opposed. That is also unanimous. Um, Article 50 is the Chamberlain Street Curve. That sounds like it's kind of a land swap. Yep. Okay. Right. All those in favor of recommending say aye. 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 Opposed, that is unanimous. Article 50 is municipal parking. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it's 51. Yeah, 51. Oops, 51. See, I got my numbers all up. Okay. Yeah, municipal. if the board may hold until uh, after the executive session. We're yes. going to wait on wait on voting for that till we do the executive session. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll hold on that. And is that the same? No, no. That's only for that one. Okay. Um, then Article 52 is easements for the Main Street Corridor reauthorization. All those in favor of recommending say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. And administrative. <coughs> South Mid, this is Article 44, Administrative, the South Middlesex Regional Vocational School District Agreement. All those in favor? Madam Chair, real quick, Mr. Kamalo, is Mr. Uh, Mieri's in on this? I, yes, uh, in, and in fact, uh, we started discussing this issue with the council representing Middlesex, uh, uh, sorry, the Middlesex uh, Regional Vocational School uh, sometime last year. We did influence a couple of the new provisions and Ray is satisfied with the document as is. So we're ready to vote tonight. We can yeah. this night. Okay, then all those in favor of recommending Article 54, South Middlesex Regional Vogue School District, please say aye. 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 And opposed. That is unanimous. And that does it for the warrant. Okay. So. Over the place. If I may, if I Mr. Kamala, please. Um, respectfully, I believe the chair will accept a motion to formally sign the 2019 annual town meeting warrant. Is there a motion for that? I'm so moved. Second. Second. All those in favor of signing the 2019 town warrant, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is <coughs> okay. We will do that. Town manager's report. Mr. Connolly, deposit yes. and investment report. The Board of Selectmen will receive a financial update from Michael Connolly, treasurer and collector. And Good evening. Good evening. Chair. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your Not manager. too far off. Um, I'm here tonight to. Uh, I would say give some good news. Usually I'm here to borrow money or to talk about borrowing some money. But this is, this is our, the, I would say, the first official quarterly report that we, we've now enacted. We'll be doing these quarterly. Um, I'm not sure if you've got, if you're able to see this, but um, basically what we've got here is general fund monies as well as uh, other deposits, which would include trust funds, uh, performance bonds, uh, 
Parks and Recreation, which is a uh, enterprise fund. And we have student activity balances, uh, accounts. We have trust funds, stabilization funds, as well as OPEB funds. So it's broken down into these three different categories, typically. Trust funds, I mean, we'll start off with general funds. Um, currently we have, this quarter, $31 million in general fund monies that are invested primarily in money market accounts. Um, MMDT is the Massachusetts Municipal Depository Trust. That's a pooled investment uh, um, investment option for uh, local governments. It's been around since 1977, and uh, the state uh, in, endorses this investment fund. Uh, so that's primarily where general fund monies are invested. Uh, you, can't, you can't have any general fund monies at risk, so uh, obviously we can't invest in stocks, bonds, or any, any long-term investments. So these, these are typically short-term investments. Um, this quarter we earned, uh, to total earnings for the quarter was 159000 in interest earned for the period ending March 31st, 2019. Average interest rate for these accounts was 2.12%, was, was ranging from 1.69 in a typical money market account. Some money market accounts are higher. The higher uh, interest rate was 2.6%, which MMDT is now offering. So that's, be, you know, what, what, that's the highest rate that's happening right now. And a lot of banks are starting to increase their rates. I've called around to the banks to uh, see what they can, can do to increase their, their interest rates for general fund investments. Uh, so thus far through the first three quarters, we've earned $404,581, and we're projected to, learn, to earn about, I'd say about 540,000 we're projected to earn. Last year we earned 356,000. I think the previous year we earned 192,000. So rates are going up, but I'm also taking advantage of, of the higher rates that are out there. So. Um, uh, so based on, on these numbers, it, you know, it looks pretty good. As you all know, uh, interest earned on general fund money has a positive effect on free cash. So that's always a positive, as well as collections. <coughs> then, then we have the second, uh, I don't know if you're looking at this actual balance report here. The second section we're, we're looking at is uh, performance bonds, um, the Parks and Recs account, and then these are other smaller trust fund accounts that have been around for many years. Typically, they're in Unibank, Middlesex Savings. Um, uh, again, they were here for many years prior, prior to my coming on board. And these are in just basic, I would say, savings or checking accounts, getting very little interest right now. Uh, for this quarter, the total the total amount was 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 two million dollars, a little over two million dollars, and it's earned uh, two thousand eight hundred and six dollars in this this past quarter. Um, again, these these are uh, some some of these trust fund accounts are school trust fund accounts, where it might be for a scholarship fund and things of that nature. And then we have the student activities uh, accounts. There's four student activity accounts that are are uh, sitting out there right now. I know there's some talk at some point in time that we're going to change how those those are, are set up, but for right now they're still the same the same uh, standard uh, where where these accounts are earning just basic interest. Um, and looking at what what it's earned for the past uh, quarter, uh, I think the average interest was. Uh, yeah, let's see. Interest quarter was. <laughs> yeah, it, it ranged from uh, a low of 0.367 percent to a high of 0.26 uh, percent. Uh, and now we're going to move on to the trust funds and the stabilization. Total number those, Michael, please. Say again. Total amount in those funds, those four funds. The, the total amount is two million point three two. So two million three 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 hundred twenty thousand. Again, they're just small accounts that are out there. They're not with the, the larger trust fund accounts that, that we're having invested through uh, an investment firm, uh, Bartholomew and Company. 
these accounts just they're on the books they've been on the books for many years um, you know, the, the person to talk to about what we would do with these accounts would be who's, who's ever you know that would be the trust fund you know the commissioners of the trust funds basically if we want to move those accounts into with the other trust funds I know when I came here my question was how come these accounts are here and these are trust funds and they're not with these other trust funds but for, for right now, that's where they're at. They're sitting in these accounts. Part of it could be when the trust fund was created, it had to, be, it had to stay at this particular account at this particular bank. The, the largest balance on the small trust is 14000 So these are, these are not uh, accounts that are going to get a lot of management attention from a, a bank holding them. But there's, in the student activities funds accounts, Right. There's two million three hundred and some thousand dollars. No, 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 that's no the grand total. It's two hundred and two thousand. Okay, and, th and that's highly it really fluctuates. I'm not sure if you're looking at if you're looking at this at all. I, I thought it was going to be on the overhead, but I guess it's not. Yeah, Mike's speaking from page one hundred and one of today's. <laughs> I'm I'm going from here to here and giving you a grand total in this section. I'm break I broke it down into sections based on my bullet points so even two hundred thousand if it was a constant balance we could try to do something better but the money flows in and then it flows out it's a real uh, there's very little activity in these accounts other except, than the student, except uh, the student uh, other than the student activities accounts so that makes up the let's explore that for a second there's very little activity on take out the two hundred grand for the student account, and I heard a two million three number. So that leaves a two million one number. Right. Why are we having two million dollars sitting there doing nothing? Well, Parks and Rec is another account that has a lot of fluctuation, and that's a million six of it. Right. Okay. So there is some activity on that. Right. Piece. There's right. a lot of activity in that one. What you don't see activity in is the Carver Trust, which is sixty five hundred. The Carver Trust. The Carver. Somebody named Carver left a small trust. See, some of these trust funds, you, again, I, I know I, there's a trust fund out there that was given to the town in, 19, in 1904. And, you know, some of these trusts go back <laughs> decades. I got and they've okay. just been sitting there. All right, we can move on. I remember when Frankfurt has cost a nickel. Oh, too bad we couldn't have used the money when, when $6,000 was worth uh, $6,000. Right. No, that's good. Let's keep going. Moving on. Keep going. On to the money, the big money. <coughs> well, we want to buy the big money. Already. That's well, the big money's in demand accounts. <laughs> I always look at the general fund money. That's that's in my opinion the big money. But we do now have money in, in trust funds. In OPEB is being handled by Bartholomew and Company. They're an investment firm. They typically handle there's over 250 municipalities that they handle. I think they're handling about 1.4 billion in total city and town funds that they invest for. Uh, and, and these funds, you can invest in long-term investments. Specifically, as we move to the trust funds, you can invest in common stock, corporate bonds, CDs, treasury bonds, government agencies. And uh, for, the, for this past, the total trust funds and stabilization funds amount to 7,018,000. Uh, and again, during this period of time, uh, it earned this portfolio earned three hundred thousand, <coughs> over three hundred thousand dollars to be specific, three three hundred thousand six hundred and twenty-six for that quarter. The annualized rate of interest for the whole portfolio was eighteen point two percent. So when you're investing in long-term investments like like uh, stocks, bonds. You could have a good quarter, depending on what's happening with the Fed, if they raise interest rates, you know, the value of the stock could go down. This past quarter, we enjoyed a, good, a very good quarter when it, when it came to investments. Um, and, and we realized, uh, you know, um, and a, a very good positive gain. And that $7 million includes stabilization and all that is what the gentleman spoke to earlier that Standard & Poor's looks to as reserves, correct? <laughs> So these trusts, those trusts anyway, are looked at as a reserve. Some of them uh, qualify as reserves. Not all of them. The stabilization would qualify as reserve. For example, the McGovern Library Trust is in there, and it would not qualify as a reserve. Right. What, uh, what of that $7 million does qualify as reserves besides That's stabilization? 
roughly? Stabilization and capital I, stabilization. I'd say stabilization and capital stabilization. So you you're so looking three at million five hundred, basically. Three million six, and then the right. community preservation is in that pool as well, and then the small trust with the McGovern Trust being the biggest of them, and then the OPEB is separate. That's the next category. Right. Mike will talk about. Right. Okay. And then, and then we have OPEP, which was mentioned tonight. Uh, currently, we have 2.45 million in, o, in the OPEP account. This is also managed by Bartholomew and Company, um, and, and and they invest in accordance to Mass General Law Chapter 60, uh, Section 203, which is referred to as the Prudent Investment Rule, investment rule, and. They invest in domestic common stock, <clears throat> international common stock, um, alternative investments, domestic bonds, inter international bonds, and, and some cash equivalents. Uh, during this period of time, uh, the portfolio gained in value of $175,632 for this period with an annualized rate of 30.89%. So again, it had a it had a good quarter this past quarter. So uh, I know last year, um, 2018, there was, there was a quarter there where we had a bad quarter, but based on what's happened, the only thing I'd be worried about, worried about is, is um, some of these stocks, as you can see, we're at 30.5% with common stock in the trust funds. You know, we might, I might wanna talk with Tim and, and Bartholomew about reducing the amount that we have in stocks because if a recession, I'm not saying there is going to be a recession, but if a recession comes, it could have a negative effect on long-term investments such as stocks and long-term corporate bonds. Okay. And I believe that is it. Are there any questions? So let me just add a comment about the program, the investing program. There's some things we really want to do. The first one we want to do is reporting. We want to get this information out to you. We want to get it to the town manager. We want to post it on the website so people can see where the 40 or $50 <coughs> million dollars we have is and that we're taking good care of it. The next thing we want to do is make sure we're compliant with all the requirements. So the commissioner bank maintains a legal list and that applies to investment restrictions for certain of our funds and we're working with our investment advisor to make sure that we're fully compliant and once we convince ourselves that we are fully compliant we're going to make sure that we are prudent in our investing and mike started to talk about the risk profile so for the cash we need to make payroll and to buy the bucket truck and to do other things we have that in the safest investments there can be and we get correspondingly low returns. For the trust funds, we have a 30% weighting in common stock and we're getting better returns. Uh, and for the OPEB, we have a 55% weighting in stock, okay. which is the money we think we need longest in the future. So what, something we should all do periodically is review our risk profile and think about whether the investment portfolio <coughs> matches our risk profile. So the advisor can advise, but they can only advise based on what our risk is. And if we were totally risk adverse, we would put the OPEB buddy all in the MMDT, earn very low percentage, and it would take us 50 more years to fund the liability. So we really have to balance that, and it's something we're looking at closely, and we look forward to talking to you about this every quarter as we bring you up to date on the status of the funds. Excellent. Great presentation, and I don't think in 10 or 11 years we've ever had that before yeah. at that level, at that level of detail. And I think it's very well done, and there's a lot of good numbers in there. I wish I had some of those numbers. Good job by Mike and Diane. Yes. And to get this quarterly now, it's quarterly fabulous. Great. <laughs> great. Well, good great. news. Awesome. Thanks. And Thank you very much. I think, I think you heard the auditor mention what an outstanding team we have in this town, that it's really above and beyond what you see in a lot of communities. So we're very pleased. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and last, last but not least, um, 
we have a public safety facility study. Some preliminary thoughts. Uh, this will be presented to the Board of Selectmen uh, by consultant Travis Miller regarding public safety facility location study. And uh, the chief has been working with Mr. Miller to start taking steps towards that fire station need that we've that's been hanging out there for us. So, quick up update would be great. Welcome. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having yeah, me. I hope the Bruins are still doing okay. I haven't gotten an update in a while. They are doing all right. They are up four to one with approximately two minutes and 34 seconds oh, left. Oh, no in pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and okay. concentrate. So I would like to make a motion to send the last Canadian team back to Canada and keep the Stanley Cup in the U.S. since 1992. Perfect. Second. Well, so second. thank you very much for yeah. having us, and I appreciate it. And Mr. Kamal, thank you for bringing us in under your agenda. And, uh, we had a little bit of dialogue with you, and I think um, I'm going to let Travis just give us a, a brief kind of synopsis of where we are and let any questions come out. So I'll wait thanks. for this one for a long time. This is great. <laughs> thank you. We're going to keep it short tonight, unfortunately. Yeah. We have to. So just so you know a little bit about who I am, thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Manager, members of the board, and um, the three people who've decided to Flint. stay this long. <laughs> That's right. Um, and for those of you running home to see the game, good luck. Um, so I've been doing uh, public safety management consulting for about 25 years. I've worked with, I don't know, five or 600 communities. I've probably done 50 or 60 projects that look at the issue we're talking about tonight, which is um, growing community, <clears throat> beginning to wonder whether or not they need to start thinking about expansion of fire rescue services. Are we located in the right place? Um, we're located in a, in a place that historically made a ton of sense because it was in the middle of what was the town surrounded by a fairly large rural area. And now, I mean, not only 495, but as you continue to expand across the community, it's become time to start asking, um, do we need a second location? Are we thinking, you know, long term? What should we be doing and where should we go? Um, we looked at a variety of options, including how good a guess did they make when they put the existing station where they put it? If we could, if we just plop a single station down someplace, could we, by moving it, improve service delivery across the community? Um, they made a really good guess. I mean, it continues to be an excellent location to maintain a fire rescue station. Um, but you are now in a position where you're gonna need to start thinking about expansion in terms of the number of stations that you've got out there. Um, you know, we kind of went into this with this open mind, and, and the way our model works is we could take addresses, we could take 80 South Street and force the model to say, hey, does that make anything better if we give that to you as a fire station? Um, we could also let the model loose and just say, okay, if we maintain headquarters where we've got it today, where would you drop a second fire station? Um, we then said, well, what if we let headquarters go away? Where would you put two stations? Um, just to sort of test and make sure because as we all know, these are, these are not decisions that you're going to make for five or ten years. These are multi-generational kinds of decisions. Are you still watching the score? Are you going to let us know when the game's over? <laughs> Thank you. Um, just making sure you're on top of your job. So as we go through this process, um, we're trying to make sure that if you go ahead and invest money, significant money, in the analysis that will need to come about what do we need in terms of facilities, and then really significant money when it comes time to build one of these facilities or more than one to make sure that you can answer when you're walking <coughs> to church or you're walking <coughs> out of the grocery store, you're out for a run and trying to cross the ramp at 495 and somebody stops you on the other side trying to cross the ramp at 495. Um, did you look at everything? Have we decided to spend this money and make this investment in the community based on considering the full range of options? And um, while we've not looked at every single piece of dirt that you might be able to go out and purchase, we have, I think, brought you to the point where you can comfortably move on to the next set of steps, which is having somebody come in and take a look at the existing facility, having that same team come in and take a look at what do we need sort of system-wide writ large in terms of public safety resources, <clears throat> Um, and then making a determination based on the existing facility, what could we take off the list of things that we need using that facility? What does that leave us with in terms of needing to construct a new facility? Um, part of that is that if I were doing this, 
I'd ask, I'd ask whoever came in and did it to give me two sets of options. One would be fire rescue only. And then the second thing I would do is look at public safety. It's not gonna cost you any more money to have them do that. It's, they're running the same analysis essentially to do it one way or the other. But I think going back to that idea of being able to answer to our constituents as we walk out of whatever we're walking out of or standing inside of some soccer field and someone approaches us, being able to say, yes, we looked at everything. Um, we, or as many of those things as we could conceive of at the time. And so I think we've done that. I think we've set you on the right path. I think it's, it's time for you to start considering what you do next. And um, that's essentially another more significant study as you were to move forward. That's the short version. Question from the board, Mr. Herr. Is this a fire safety only, or is this a fire safety and police sort of combined effort? Yeah, so um, given the size of the community, the location of the law enforcement, where law enforcement responds from is dynamic. Once they've come out of roll call and patrol is distributed across the community the way that they're going to distribute themselves, where you're report writing station is or where your lockup is or any of those things is pretty irrelevant geographically, right? If you're Las Vegas and Bureau of Land Management comes in and says, okay, you can take that 10,000 acres, which literally have, they literally come in and say, you can have the, that 15 square mile area over there. Metro PD and everybody else goes in and says, we need another police station. We need eight more fire stations. We need 14 more elementary schools. I mean, it's crazy, right? You're not in that situation. Because law enforcement's generally dynamically deployed, whether you move that one mile or three miles or four miles one way or the other, or you leave it where it is, it's not gonna impact their response times to, to critical calls. Okay. And from a people going to pick up a traffic report or detectives going out, leaving from where they, their office is to go to somebody's house and interview them is irrelevant. So it's the statically deployed, the generally statically deployed nature of fire rescue, which requires you to do that same analysis that Walgreens does, right? They, it's the same model, except their customers come to them as opposed to you going to your customers on a fire rescue basis. I think the idea came up fairly late in the conversation, which was, if you're going to bring in architects and engineers and geotech people, and you're gonna bring in somebody like me to look at operations and all this, this team that, you'll, that you will assemble in this next project, it, it just makes sense to look at it from an overall public safety needs assessment perspective, rather than simply looking at it from a, hey, do we need more places for firefighters to sleep so that we can make sure we're getting to places in X minutes or less? And meeting, you know, using the standard that the chief has developed, um, it, it, providing the level of service that we want to provide as often as possible without saying to people, gee, we're going to have to go to mutual aid because we don't have any resources here within the, the community. So it's both. Got it. With the satellite being more on the police law enforcement side. Yeah, and I, I, I think that really what will end up happening if you do this, if you build whether it's a new fire station or it's a new public safety facility, the demands of modern fire rescue and what that looks like in terms of people thinking not only about, you know, engines and ambulances and ladder trucks and a chief's car coming out of a garage and a place for people to live and sleep. It's, I had the, I had the absolute great pleasure of being here on Marathon Day. It was, and I got, I mean, the chief, it's a really nice thing. We got a chance to be behind the scenes and see it and the impact that that has on you, even if it's only that event, the fact that every, every public safety resource in this community is essentially a quarter mile away from the starting line. The EOC and the way that you're having to like sort of distribute the management of that significant event to various small pockets around the community, you've got things like that that you ought to be looking at also. It's very possible that you'd end up in a, with a headquarters for fire rescue that is not where it sits right now. Mm -hmm. And that that'll be the substation. Okay. Mr. Kamal. Great question, Mr. Here. Great answer. It also needs to be said, part of this discussion, again, includes uh, police, fire. The other two key functions that public safety uh, um, uh, performs, 
communications yep. as well as emergency management. Yep. <clears throat> so in this discussion, I think, as, as <clears throat> was mentioned earlier, initially our thought process was let's look at the <coughs> fire department but as we progressed we said perhaps this is the opportunity to leverage the resources that may actually already be assembled and mobilized to then look at the broader issues regarding public safety that includes police fire communications and emergency management i have a quick question yeah were you able to review the um the study from the uh, the report from the study that uh, that was done with the, with the Ashland um, yeah the MRI regional. regional oh good yeah I mean I we're not here to talk about regionalization which I'm a huge proponent for um, but that just sort of kicked this off originally uh, yeah I mean I think well I think that as you look at the at, you look at service delivery if you're thinking about building a new station and somebody else near you is thinking about building a new station, it's worthwhile communicating with one another about where those resources are going to go, whether you merge or not. I've worked in environments, there are counties that I've worked with that have 20 fire departments. They're all separate. They do these countywide merger studies constantly. The answer is always no. But what they've done is they've figured out operational ways to make the interaction of those departments seamless whether it's something so simple as we're going to have regional dispatch that's going to go get me the three closest engines, the closest ladder, and the closest chief that can come run this event. I mean, I've done things where I've literally been sitting in a battalion chief's car. We went and ran an event with units from five communities in a community that that person didn't work for. But it's the same operating procedures. They, they're going to do the same things. The units are staffed the same way. They've got the same equipment. So from a, a broader community perspective, an accident up on 495, big accident, you know that what you're getting is going to be the same no matter what community sends it to you. Yeah, my comment was specific to the three years the chief and I sat in a meeting once a week with some neighboring towns. We just couldn't make it happen. Well, there were some... There were some we um, do shared response, but the, we were literally looking at infrastructure and just couldn't play out. Yeah, there, there were issues with... The, with I was familiar with that. I bid on that project. I was familiar with what went on sort of in the background of the project. I know a lot of the people that were involved in that, and it, it, it was allowed to run away from itself mm -hmm. in, a, in a significant and early way, yes. unfortunately. Well, I, I'm sorry to bring this to a close, but we have an executive session we have to pick up with as well, and I trust that we will be seeing Mr. Miller again yep. to move ahead with this force. So um, unless there are some burning questions, I'd like to... I think we need to move the meeting along. Thank you very sure. much for coming. Thank you very much. We appreciate what you've done. Appreciate it, Madam Chair. Working with you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. It's game over. It's <coughs> over. Four one. Appreciate it. We won. Yay. Good. The cup stays in the U.S. Out of the again. Out of Columbus. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Did you say you're a friend of Columbus? Thank you. Uh, oh, oh, all right. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Board members, um, I, I, in the interest of the hour and our yeah, later right. obligations, I would like to pass over liaison reports, board invites, and agenda items unless there is something nope. so moved. burning. I, w I will say uh, we did receive a notice. There is a um, meeting on the night of April 24th, that's Thursday, at 5 McAdam Road in Hoppington at 7 o'clock regarding the CSX, the uh, CXX bridge that is going to be rebuilt on Fruit Street and they are discussing um, and rather than keeping one lane open for a four-year project they're discussing closing the entire bridge for a full year so if anyone is interested in that it's going to be quite a disruption um, they might want to attend that so are there other things okay um, hearing none I would just like to make one comment before we close out um, this is our last selectman's meeting of this board before the election on May 20th. Of course, we have town meeting. Um, I sincerely hope, as I believe Mr. Ted Stone does, that we will both be given the honor to continue to serve on this board. But I would just like to say thank you to the entire team, to our town team, our town manager, our assistant manager, um, all our town officials that we've worked with, and for all my fellow members of the Board of Selectmen, um, I, it's been an experience that has honored me. I've learned so much, and I've been just delighted to work with everyone, and I want to say thank you. I feel the exact same way. OK. 
Okay. And with that, is there a motion to adjourn? No, no, no. We're, we're going to, we're, we're, don't we, we're not adjourning. We're going back into executive session. Don't we, we adjourn from executive session? Do we adjourn the main meeting? And do I need to adjourn the main meeting and then we pick up executive or not adjourn this? We have anything to do after this? <laughs> um, I'm trying to digest two things here. Yeah. The, the, the motion should be to end the open session and move into reconvene. executive, yes, reconvene in executive session. Correct. Uh, and to adjourn the meeting at the end of the executive session. So moved. Okay. <laughs> Uh, oh, yes. All those in favor say <laughs> aye. 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 Opposed, thank you. In the executive session we're going to, this should be a roll call vote to go into executive session. Hurry up. That's done. Okay. Okay. That's, that's really yes. Okay, that's too much. All right, thank you. We, we make sure we record it as such. Yep. Yeah.